Okay, then I will go because I just leave in a few minutes and I don't want to fuck up the recording. So cool, yeah. man. All right, take care. Bye, right, man. Soon, man. Yeah, we'll see you one. soon. Yeah, have a nice one. You too, Bye. man. For some reason, the audio is hella fucky. It keeps going back to being all glitched out. Uh, and then I just reset it, and then it's fine for a while. Uh-oh. This computer is a piece of shit, and uh, Chris is going to have me send it back to him. He's paying for the shipping. He's going to fix a bunch of shit. He didn't realize there were problems like this. He just did some simple tests, but he didn't actually try to use it. That sucks. All right. I'm going to click record. Three, two, one. All right, everybody. Welcome to Exegetical Readings with David Nance at Theory Underground. Uh, we are back doing hub events, but we are recording this as a discreet um, recording that will be available after the fact. Probably publish it live on the channel. So if you're watching this from the YouTube channel, welcome. If it's the first time you've ever seen anything at Theory Underground, we do stuff like this all the time. Uh, there's always hub events at Theory Underground going on every week that you can join as well, where we are doing exegetical readings. We have office hours for the ongoing courses at the Theory Underground course site, as well as the app, which is a clunky and buggy attempt at uh, our own theory social social media site and uh it's not just any old social media but it's supposed supposedly supposed to be social media kind of based around the courses and the subject matters that we deal with here and one of those subject matters is time energy and time energy theory is something i've been developing since my master's thesis at boise state university it was an interdisciplinary degree uh, but it largely drew from philosophy and really Heidegger and Marx. Um, so it's an existential analysis of labor power, which is to say uh, time energy is large energy infused, repeatable blocks of time throughout the week, month, year. Uh, and we don't have that, right? It's a precondition for everything important in life, but we don't have that because that gets gobbled up by capital. Capital needs our labor power. So time energy gets reduced to labor power, leaving us with nothing but garbage time at the end of the day or the week. Garbage time is time without energy or the kind of energy that cannot be harnessed because the time itself is not reliable, repeatable. Um, and so you end up fucking off and scrolling on your phone or going and doing regular consumer activities, but you're not able to learn languages, play the violin or do the kinds of things that we're trying to do here at Theory Underground, which has become multilingual, um, theoretically literate um, uh, people. So that's the that's the basic idea of like what what we're doing. That, that's what that's where Andre Gors comes in, and so Andre Gors is relevant to time energy theory because we've discovered him only really this year, uh, but he is associated with the new left. Uh, he is considered to be a post-Marxist for reasons that are going to become very clear in this exegetical reading. Um, and the reason that we're doing this exegetical reading today is because we're having a conversation with Daniel Tut tomorrow um, about a controversial tweet that he made. Maybe we'll show it on the screen later. We don't need to show it right now. The long and short of it was he said that uh, books like this one, Farewell to the Working Class, are indicative of really one of the biggest problems with the new left, which was its rejection of the working class. And he got a lot of heat for saying that. A lot of people were mad. Not, not so much because people love Andre Gores. I don't think most people know who Andre Gores is. But people were upset because he was taking a swing at anti-work as a movement itself saying that it was the the new left's tendency to go anti-work that was a big part of its uh, abandonment of the working class. And uh, so we basically, uh, well, we like Gores and uh, we've, we had to brush up on this and now we're going to discuss it. 
um, while reading it. And yeah, that's basically my introduction. Nance, what do you want to say about it? Um, there were, there are parts of this book that surprised the shit out of me. Um, a lot of it is stuff we've been saying, uh, uh, stuff that has, I guess, emerged from our own particular situatedness, but also from conversations. Um, and the fact that the things that we are seeing and, and, uh, you know, coming up with have been evident for decades at this point and no one else is talking about them. No one wants to incorporate them into um, any public discourse. It's, it's interesting. It's frustrating. It's validating in a way. It's like, okay, yeah, like I'm not the only one who feels this way. Um, and the, yeah, it's great. This is, this is fucking awesome. Everyone should read this book. It's short enough. Uh, everyone should read Paths to Paradise as well. These are short books. They're, they're great, I think. If you are uh, associated with the left or if you're associated with organizing or if you're associated with the idea of emancipation, I think Gore's is, is uh, essential. We need right. to add him and to so the we, canon. He is, he is. Yeah, exactly. And he, he is definitely canon for us at this point. We read Paths to Paradise because Michael Downs from The Dangerous Maybe, one of our friends, um, for a long time now said we needed to read it and that this is the Marxist that we needed. Um, he's like, this is our Marxist. We're, we're, and he was like talking about Gore's like, he's a, like a secret, like, like, and I've started saying that is that Andre Gore's is the internet left's best kept secret. And um, I didn't realize that he was influential on Nick Cernicek and Alex Williams book, uh, inventing the future. It makes sense that that's the case. But going off of this text alone, I would say that in some ways, Gores is doing a lot of things that I haven't seen anywhere. And that, like you said, it feels like it's our own ideas being read back at us. And it's like, how do we not know about this? Um, Past Paradise is a bunch of theses. It's kind of like his... You know, it's like he's Martin Luther and he's nailing it to the left door um, saying, like, here's all my theses on, like, why everything right now is not going anywhere serious and what, what needs to be done. And in that reading of Paths to Paradise, I had said that I consider him to be a sort of post left thinker. Now, when people are calling him new left, that makes it hard to say that he's post left. But the thing is, is he's post old left. And the thing is, is the new left gets talked about like it's a totality, like it's a bunch of people who agreed on a certain set of assumptions. And I've always been fine with that idea and talking about the shortcomings of the new left. But that was before I realized that people are lumping people like Andre Gores in with the new left. That, that complicates things because Andre Gores is not like one of the leading intellectuals of the Students for Democratic Society. SDS in the United States, that was the largest student organization. And I thought SDS and their, their statement, the Mont Pelerin or whatever the fuck you call it statement, I thought that is basically the essence of the new left. And I don't see how this um, is reducible to that. And so um, so that's that's the main thing. And then I'll just say that there's a lot in here that's not in Paths to Paradise. Uh, and so we're really excited to read it to you guys and to discuss it and add context as to why we care, because I was assuming, and I still think that like, as I read it, a lot of you all watching this or listening to it probably won't get why some of what he's saying detonates for us the way it does. Um, there's, there's some context, there's some stuff that you would have to have already thought about or cared about in order for it to even uh, resonate the way it does for us. And so we'll try to like add that context because a lot of you aren't Marxists or uh, yeah, never were. And if you never were a Marxist or you were never really convinced about like Marx has the fundamental critique of both capitalism and the left that is so important. If, if you were never convinced of that, then this 
won't matter. Post-Marxism shouldn't matter to you because you're like, well, I'm already post-Marx because I'm not a Marxist. And it's like, well, yeah, but also Marx is really important for destroying a bunch of the bullshit that you probably believe. If you've not spent time tarrying with Marx and thinking about him seriously, uh, then I don't know. A lot of this would probably fly right over your head. And we don't want it to fly over your head. We want you to have a basic understanding of Marx and a an understanding as to why, even if you aren't a Marxist, you need to be thinking in dialogue with Marxists. And so, I don't know. Anything you would want to add to that line of thought, Nance, before we get going? Um. Yeah. I, no, I mean, just the idea of, like, post-Marxism or a Marxism, as in, like, non-Marxism. Um, I think they're definitely different things. I do think if, if we can bring some of the the a Marxist or the non Marxists over into this version of post Marxism, I think that would be that would be the shit. Um, we definitely probably won't reach any anti Marxists, but uh, um, I mean, ultimately, I guess that that is a point of emph emphasis is to figure out a way to to make this language palatable to people who are just um, not only not engaged with Marxism, but but who react strongly against it and i i do think gorse has a lot uh to offer those people uh we just got to figure out the language right because for some reason guys like daniel tut chris catrone doug lane they they do a lot online and they've never really seriously engaged with andre gores and we're just little babies over here trying to understand things and we were like convinced that there's like there's like the identity politics rad lib woke school left versus the base materialist more or less marxist left and that's been the divide for a while now and we did not know that there was this that this and that's why we're calling this the best kept secret it's like I, they they don't want to seriously engage with this. And I was reading an article that critiques Andre Gores by lumping him up with UBI, Universal Basic Income People. And so people think that critiques of UBI apply to Gores. And everything I was getting in that article shows me that there is no rigorous engagement here. They're just lumping him up with these other people they're critiquing. And the fact is, is if you actually take the time to read him, He's very careful, nuanced, and he sets up his caveats in such a way so as to not be reducible to those UBI people. He is actually a big critic of those, you know, Andrew Tate, not Andrew Tate, sorry, Andrew Gay, uh, Elon Musk, um, uh, Friedman, and, uh, like whatever, all of these, Charles Murray, like all these different, like uh, liberal conservative UBI people are not, not in any way, shape, or form um, what he's doing. Like, Gores is on some other level. And, uh, and, and it's not just that he's, like, post marks like, oh, he's over it. it. No, he's no, not he's over, over it. it. This whole book is written. Like, like, he's very, very much engaged with it. There. So with that said, I'm going to do some organizing in my new space while I'll Nance reads from the preface, and then I'll take a turn. But basically, uh, as far as updates go, there's there's piles of boxes all around me. Uh, I can't see them right now, but, but there's there's lock boxes and and, 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 and it just, just it's absolutely awesome. There's hard to do organizing. And while I do that, I will listen and answer all of you. And say so thank you for doing this, Nance. Um, let's get into it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Preface, Nine Theses for a Future Left. This book is an essay in the fullest sense of the word. It is an attempt to outline the perspectives and themes, and the themes around which a left endowed with a future rather than burdened with nostalgia might re-emerge. It makes no pretense to have answered all the questions it raises. Its central theme is the liberation of time and the abolition of work, a theme as old as work itself. Work has not always existed in the way in which it is currently understood. It came into being at the same time as capitalists and proletarians. It means an activity carried out for someone else in return for a wage, 
according to forms and time schedules laid down by the person paying the wage and for a purpose not chosen by the worker. A market gardener works. A miner growing leaks in his back garden carries out a freely chosen activity. Work nowadays refers almost exclusively to activities carried out for a wage. The terms work and job have become interchangeable. Work is no longer something that one does, but something that one has. One looks for work and finds work, just as one looks for or finds a job. Work is an imposition, a heterodetermined, heteronymous activity perceived by most of those who either have it or are looking for it as a nondescript sale of time. One works at Peugeot or at Boussac's rather than to make cars or textiles. One has a good job or a bad job according to how much one earns, and only secondly according to the nature of the task and its purpose. One can have a good job in the armaments industry and a bad job in the health service. For both money, <coughs> for both wage earners and employers, work is only a means of earning money and not an activity that is an end in itself. Therefore, work is not freedom. Of course, in any sort of work, even on an assembly line, a minimum of freely given commitment is essential. Without it, everything grinds to a halt. But this necessary minimum of freedom is, at the same time, negated and repressed by the organization of work itself. This is why the notion that it is necessary to free ourselves in work, as well as from work, and from work as well as in our work, is as old as the waged working class itself. During the heroic age of the labor movement, the abolition of work and the abolition of wage labor were goals between which no difference was made. 2. The difference between wage labor and self-determined activity is the same as the difference be between use value and exchange value. Work is carried out essentially for a wage, which serves to sanction the social utility of the activity in question and entitles its recipient to a quantity of social labor equivalent to that which he or she has sold. Working for a wage amounts to working in order to purchase as much time from society as a whole as it has previously received. Self-determined activity, on the other hand, is not principally concerned with the exchange of quantities of time. It is its own end, whether it takes the form of aesthetic activity, like games, including love, or artistic creation. When self-determined activity is one of production, it is concerned with the creation of objects destined not for sale, but to be consumed or used by the producers themselves or by their friends or relatives. The abolition of work will only work will only be emancipatory if it also allows the development of autonomous activity. Thus, the abolition of work does not mean abolition of the need for effort, the desire for activity, the pleasure of creation, the need to cooperate with others and be of some use to the community. Instead, the abolition of work simply means the progressive, but never total, suppression of the need to purchase the right to live, which is almost synonymous with the right to a wage, by alienating our time and our lives. The abolition of work means the freeing or liberation of time, freeing time so that individuals can exercise control over their bodies, their use of themselves, their choice of activity, their goals and productions, represents a demand that has been translated in a regrettably reductive way by the phrase, the right to idleness. The demand to work less does not mean or imply the right to rest more, but the right to live more. It means the right to do many more things for ourselves than money can buy, and even to do some of the things which money can't at present can buy. This demand has never been more urgent than now. This is so for a number of reasons which legit, legitimate and reinforce one another. 3. The most immediately apparent of these reasons is that the abolition of work is a process already underway and likely to accelerate. In each of the three leading industrialized nations of Western Europe, independent economic forecasts have estimated that automation will eliminate 4 to 5 million jobs in 10 years unless there is a sharp reduction in the number of working hours, as well as in the form and purpose of productive activity. Keynes is dead. 
In the context of the current crisis and technological revolution, it is absolutely impossible to restore full employment by quantitative economic growth. The alternative, rather, lies in a different way of managing the abolition of work. Instead of a society based on mass unemployment, a society can be built in which time has been freed. A society based on mass unemployment is coming into being before our eyes. It consists of a growing mass of the permanently unemployed on one hand, an aristocracy of tenured workers on the other, and between them, a proletariat of temporary workers carrying out the least skilled and most unpleasant types of work. The outlines of a society based on the free use of time are only beginning to appear in the interstices of, and in opposition to, the present social order. Its watchword may be defined as, let us work less so that we may all, we all may work and do more things by ourselves in our free time. Socially useful labor, distributed over all those willing and able to work, will thus cease to be anyone's exclu exclusive or leading activity. Instead, people's major occupation may be one or a number of self-defined activities, carried out not for money but for the interest, pleasure, or benefit involved. The manner in which the abolition of work to be managed and socially implemented constitutes the central political issue of the coming decades. I just, I don't even know how that can, how anything that, that we've read so far can actually lend itself to saying that he's responsible or even like impl like uh, implicated in anti-work. Anti like, he just he just spent all this time talking about how we need to reduce this kind of work so that we can do other kinds of work that aren't you know that are free free activity it's just this is not like oh yeah well we should be with the right to be lazy or like the we want idle time like he's he's just he's saying it all right there i don't see how any of this is like uh contestable really yeah, I th yeah, I think uh, if you lump him in with the anti-work crowd, then sure, shit on him. But if you read him, then you kind of can't lump him in. So, yeah. Yeah. The social implementation, or four, the social implementation of the abolition of work requires that we put an end to the confusion that has arisen under the influence of Keynesianism between the right to work and the right to a paid job the right to an income, the right to create use values, the right of access to tools that offer the possibility of creating use values. The need to dissociate the right to an income from the right to a job had already been stressed at the beginning of the second industrial revolution, that associated with Taylorism. It was apparent then, as it is today, that the reduction in the number of working hours required to produce necessities called for new mechanisms of distribution independent of the laws of the market and the law of value. If goods produced with a minimal expenditure of labor were to be purchased, it was necessary to supply the population with means of payment bearing no relation to the price of the hours of work they had put in. Ideas like those of Jacques Dubois in particular, concerning a social income guaranteed for life and a currency that cannot be accumulated, continue to circulate, mainly in Northern Europe. Also, kind of sounds like the Gotha program. Socialized distribution of production, according to need rather than effective demand, was for a long time one of the central demands of the left. This is now becoming ever less the case. In itself, it can only lead to the state taking greater charge of individual lives. The right to a social income or social wage for life in part abolishes forced wage labor, only in favor of a wage system without work. It replaces or complements, as the case may be, exploitation with welfare, while perpetuating the dependence, impotence, and subordination of individuals to centralized authority. This subordination will be overcome only if the autonomous production of use values becomes a real possibility for everyone. Thus, the division between left, in scare quotes, and right, in scare quotes, will, in the future, tend to occur less over the issue of the social wage rather than over the right to autonomous production. 
The right to autonomous production is fundamentally the right of each grassroots community to produce at least part of the goods and services it consumes without having to sell its labor to the owners of means of production or to buy goods and services from third parties. The right to autonomous production presupposes the right of access to tools and their conviviality. It is incompatible. Um, okay. And there's a footnote here on conviviality. And there's other ones that I've been skipping, but this one matters. Even Ivan Illich uses the term convivial to define tools that enhance the ability of people to pursue their own goals in their unique way, as against programmed tools which engender predetermined actions. So, the right to autonomous production presupposes the right of access to tools and their conviviality. It is incompatible with private or public industrial, commercial, or professional monopolies. It implies a contraction of commodity production and sale of labor power, and a concomitant extension of autonomous production based on voluntary cooperation, the exchange of services, or personal activity. Autonomous production will develop in all those fields in which the use value of time can be seen to, to be greater than its exchange value. In other words, it will develop in situations in which what one can do oneself in a given period of time is worth more than what one could, do, could buy by working the equivalent period of time for a wage. Only if it is combined with effective possibilities for autonomous production will the liberation of time point beyond the capitalist logic wage systems and market relations. Effective possibilities for autonomous production cannot exist for everyone without a policy providing adequate collective facilities for that purpose. And this is for subsection A. Autonomous productive activity is not to be confused with housework. As Ivan Illich has shown, the notion of housework only appeared with the development of a type of sexual division of a labor specific to industrialism. Industrialist civilization has confined women in domestic activities that are not directly productive, so that men may spend all their working hours in factories and mines. As a result, women's activities in the household have ceased to be autonomous and self-determined. Women's work has become the precondition and subordinate appendage of male wage labor. Only the latter is considered important and essentially productive. The notion that waged workers need to be relieved of domestic tasks, regarded as degrading and inferior, whereas waged work is supposedly noble, this notion is specific to capitalist ideology. The only important thing is to get paid irrespective of the purpose, meaning, or nature of the job. Hence, the housewife's activities are considered to be degrading and inferior, whereas the same activities performed for a wage in a nursery, an airplane, or a nightclub, are hel held to be perfectly dignified and acceptable. At the same, at the time, as the time spent working falls, leaving more free time, so heteronomously determined work tends to become secondary and autonomous activity dominant. A revolution in patterns of behavior and a redefinition of values tend to endow domestic or family-based activities with a new dignity and lead to the abolition of the sexual division of labor. It is already underway in Protestant societies. Woman's liberation is not to be found in wages for housework, but through association and cooperation between equals who, within the family or enlarged family, share all tasks, both inside and outside the home and, where necessary, take turns at various tasks. 5. The abolition of work is neither acceptable nor desirable for people who identify with their work, define themselves through it, and do or hope to realize themselves in their work. Thus, the social subject of the abolition of work will not be the stratum of skilled workers who take pride in their trade and in the real or potential power it confers on them. The main strategic goal of this social stratum, which has always been hegemonic within the organized labor movement, will remain the appropriation of work of the work tools and of power over production. Automation will always be perceived by skilled workers as a direct attack on their class insofar as it undermines workers' class power over production and eliminates the possibility to identify with one's work, or even to identify one's work at all. Thus, their major concern will be to resist automation rather than to turn its weapons against their attackers.
protecting jobs and skills, rather than seeking to control and benefit from the way in which work is abolished, will remain the major concern of traditional trade unionism. This is why it is bound to remain on the defensive. That fucking shit's so good right there. The abolition of work is, on the other hand, a... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a... It's like our, uh, our homie David from Seattle, um, who's a part of the electricians union. Um, his, he, he, you know, he's looking, his forward looking move is to say there needs to basically be, they need to be able to take on whatever jobs they want and go out there into the field and do this electrical work. And they need like a sort of like this union uh should be able to make it possible that they, that they're able they're basically more free to choose their hours to get paid higher um but he's he, he kind of has like a guild in mind yeah. and that is a good example of what gores is talking about here people who do f- identify with their work who get a strong sense of identity from their work being like yeah i just want to have more control I want to have more control over the means of production. I want to have more control over my actual schedule. Those people are more likely as a class to, or as a section of the working class to resist automation and really a work, a, a move towards a, a post-work job centric society. And, you know, so his concern is not even so much, more time in the day and higher wages it's his actual biggest concern motivating him was an annoyance with the people in his union who aren't showing up for meetings because oh if we had more people then we could get more done and then we'd have more autonomy but he wants autonomy within work we want autonomy from work that doesn't mean that this work will go away it doesn't mean that professions like his will become irrelevant um, but it does mean that we cannot expect your rank and file electrician to see a common cause with the precariat of adjuncts and gig economy workers and loop and proles and pretty much everybody and anybody who is feeling like, oh, job is just a soul sucking thing and work is something I want freedom from. So that to be able to create that common cause is going to require a kind of work. It, it requires us to time energy pill them and to find a way to talk about what Gores is talking about here in a way that will be relatable. Yeah. The, the dignity of work is real. Right. And that's why I fucking love Anne's Anne's piece because it just, it's so good how she explains when she is not working, she loses her sense of self. And I love, I, yeah. I, I love it. And it's true with the dignity of work. There's also, if you're not working, um, many people do need to work to, to see themselves and feel, feel good. And I mean, that's true and it's undeniable, but when it is converted into labor or a job is, is when it becomes, um, not, a, not a good thing. And, and so I, I do see how people would react against the anti-work movement because it does sound like just a bunch of lazy stoners. Um, Right. But no, like I, I want to be in in it. Like I, it often is. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like uh, it often is. um, I want to be free to, to read books and make art and build things. I love building things with my hands. Like I want to be free to do all these things. Um, right. And use my creative power. Um, but when it is converted into a job, when it is converted into labor power, that is the problem. And that is what we're trying to overcome. Um, we're not trying to, and when it's, when it's constantly done with an eye to its exchange value as well. So this it's like, okay. Let's just say that you're an electrician. You love being an electrician. You have no interest in being anything but an electrician who sometimes hangs out at the bar afterwards. If that was, if that makes you happy, the society we're talking about and the Gore's advocates for here would still allow you to do that 
um, assuming that automation didn't make a lot of your shit re- irrelevant. But the point is, is that insofar as what you're doing is socially necessary labor, then that would be a part of heteronymous labor. And the point of his trifecta between heteronymous, cooperative, and autonomous forms of labor is to say that, yeah, we just need to use mass scale industry and technology and automation, basically STEM in college. All of that should be Instead of focused on profit, it should be focused on freeing up people from heteronomy, which is to say forced labor, like forced preoccupation with necessary labor. So that socially necessary labor is something that we still need. The machines will be able to do a lot of it. We're still going to need expert technicians. And those expert technicians, we're still going to want to say, yeah, no, you get to have a dignified life and a lot of time off and only work 22,000 hours to, to you, you should only have to work 22,000 hours as your expert technic technician self um, to get a roof over your head for your entire life, to get to travel, to get to go to ski mountains, to get to go, you know, hang out at the river and take pictures of trees. You should be able to skateboard and play music and learn languages and travel the world as an expert technician. And then, if you want to do more outside those 22,000 hours, well, the thing is all these people who are doing autonomous or cooperative forms of labor are going to want you. Mm -hmm. They're still going to want you because if I want to build a building that is not necessary, it's not considered socially necessary labor. It's uh, it's pure excess. I want to have a 3000 foot tower for theory underground. And then I have an elevator that takes me to the top in 30 seconds. And then I can stand up there and I can see the whole world. And I've got giant screens for our exegetical sessions that we're doing up there. Well, social society's heteronymous labor is not going to go towards that. That's going to be extra. And if you want to help me with that, you can bring your expert architect or engineer or electrician knowledge to the project. That would be a cooperative project, but it falls outside the realm of heteronymous labor. Yeah, and, and it's it's not coercive. Currently, we have billionaires basically doing that, and people are coerced into it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like undocumented Mexicans are doing it for Trump's towers, yeah, for instance. Yeah, or the World Cup. Um, like that whole debacle. Yeah. Um, we we should all be free to choose these things. Um and I, I just, I, I, yeah, yeah. Um, all right. The abolition of work is, on the other hand, a central objective for all those who, whatever they may have learned, find that their work can never be a source of personal fulfillment or the center of their lives, at least for as long as work remains synonymous with fixed hours, pre-planned tasks, limited competence, regularity, and acid assiduity over months and years, and the general impossibility of being active in several fields at the same time. All those who are allergic to work, as Rousselet has put it, can no longer be considered to be marginals. They are not part of a subculture existing on the fringes of society, but represent a real or potential majority of those in active employment who see their work as a tedious necessity in which it is impossible to be fully involved. This non-involvement is largely the result of the divergent changes on the cultural level on the one hand, and on the type of skills required by the majority of jobs on the other. Jobs have tended to become intellectualized, that is, to require mental rather than manual operations, without stimulating or satisfying intellectual capacities in any way. Hence the impossibility for workers to identify with their work and to feel that they belong to the working class. I have used the term a non-class of non-workers to designate the stratum that experiences its work as an externally imposed obligation in which you waste your life to earn your living. Its goal is the abolition of workers and work rather than their appropriation. And this prefigures the future world. The abolition of work can have no other social subject than this non-class. I do not infer from this that it is already capable of taking the process of abolishing work under its control 
and of producing a society based upon the liberation of time. And this, I like how he is kind of doing this. And that, I think that's in reference to Marx. It feels very like, hey, look, anyway, I'm rambling. All I am asserting is that such a society cannot be produced without or in opposition to this non-class, but only by it or with its support. To object that it is hard to see how a non-class could seize power is beside the point. See, he's anticipating people who want to, like, just be silly Marxists. Its obvious incapacity to seize power does not prove either that the working class is capable of doing so, if it were, it would be obvious, or that power should be seized rather than dismantled, controlled, if not abolished altogether. 6. The definition of the non-class of non-workers as a potential social subject of the abolition of work is not the result of an ethical or ideological choice. The choice is not between the abolition of work and the reestablishment of well-rounded trades in which everyone can find satisfaction. The choice is either a socially controlled emancipatory abolition of work or its oppressive antisocial abolition. It is impossible to reverse the general trend, which is at once social, economic, and technological, and reestablish the old crafts for everybody's benefit, so that autonomous groups of workers may control both production and its products and find personal fulfillment in their work. Inevitably, as the process of production becomes socialized, the personal character of work is eroded. The process of socialization implies a division of labor and a standardization of fo and formalization of tools, procedures, tasks, and knowledge. Even if, in accordance with recent trends, relatively small decentralized units of production were to replace the industrial dinosaurs of the past, and even if mindless even if repetitive mindless work were abolished, or should this be impossible, distributed among the population as a whole, socially necessary labor would still never be comparable to the activities of crafts workers or artists. It will never be a self-defined activity in which each individual or group freely determines the modalities and objectives of work and leaves its inimitable personal touch upon it. The socialization of production inevitably implies that microprocessors or ball bearings, sheet metals or fuels are interchangeable wherever they are produced, so that both the work and the machinery involved also have the same interchangeable characteristics everywhere. This interchangeability is a fundamental precondition for reducing the length of working time and distributing socially necessary labor among the population as a whole. The old proposal as old as the working class movement itself, to reduce the number of working hours by 20% by employing a corresponding proportion of additional workers implicitly presupposes that workers and work are more or less interchangeable. If 1,000 people on a 32-hour work week are to do the work of 800 people working 40 hours, then the, then the type of work must not call for irreplaceable, irreplaceable personal skills. This, this thing, like... Uh, we're all fungible. Not only are the tasks and the procedures and everything so standardized and so discre dis discretized, that's not a word, but yeah, everything has become fungible, um, including people. Thus, the depersonalization. Right, like isol isolatable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's, and the thing is, is like, if if automation gets to the point where uh, heart surgeons can be replaced and supposedly we were basically there 10 years ago um because i saw i saw some videos talking about machines that were already uh statistically doing better than heart surgeons um there will still be people who want human beings to do the heart surgery and there will still be human beings who want to do the heart surgery but right now the main people who go into being heart surgeons were people who just got really good grades and wanted to make a lot of money. And sure, they wanted to help people too. But if we could separate the profit motive from the, the calling, then we'd have more people who are there just because it's a calling. And we wouldn't have people who are doing it just for the money because that's where automation comes in. Right. And I think that principle applies across the spectrum to where it's like, oh, I have a friend who does blacksmithing and, and guess what? 
he doesn't have to. Society doesn't need him to do that. Um, but some people prefer custom work. Um, and in and, and in a future where heteronymous labor is largely automated and then redistributed, that leaves a lot of cooperative and autonomous labor where people will still be doing heart surgery and or in this case, custom, you know, metal work for, you know, your you have some vision for what you want your this thing, this table in your house to look like. And so my buddy Anthony is going to do this for you or whatever. It's like, that's, that's farmer's market shit though. Yeah. Farmer's markets can exist. Farmer's markets can exist in a society where we've collectivized and largely automated heteronymous labor. Well, and, and we do have, so for the upper strata, there's always like boutique goods and, and services. Um, and those exist because people want the experience or the the person, the personal relationship with or to whatever it is they're buying. Like we have cars, but there are still people who pay extra to ride on horse carriages for like, right, like, right, right. Um, there there will be space for people to, um to get the things that they want to experience. And that can only happen if people are freed up to do the things they want to do in the first place. Um, yeah, it's, I would just, uh, sorry, I'm like washing dishes while we're doing this. That is uh, the tie-in back to Baudrillard where it's like symbolic exchange matters for human if 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 there if there's a future where there are humans and they get to have human lives then that means nothing outside of a world wherein we have symbolic exchange right and what we're basically saying is have heteronymous labor take everything that's fungible and exchangeable out of being our central preoccupation yeah and instead have our central preoccupations be with singular activities that cannot be ever perfectly exchanged or made fungible because the idea with symbolic exchange is that the gifts that we give one another can never be countered by a perfect gift that count that that absolves the debt instead we live in networks of um irreducible obligation to one another and we all bring something to the table so like when people see something like theory underground and think, Oh, well, how's this going to be an institution outside of Dave, bitch? This is my fucking shit. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> it's it will not. die with me. <laughs> yeah, dude. It will die. It will die with me. And that's okay. They, they like, they're thinking that everything has to be turned into a McDonald's and it's like, yeah. no, turn McDonald's into McDonald's, but, but let people have singular things. You yeah know? and and we and that's I'm, like my buddy anthony my buddy anthony doesn't just do blacksmithing he also does carpentry and he also does jewelry making and he he's able to make immaculate things where he's using all wood and metal and and he combines it all in ways that a, a person who's just doing blacksmithing wouldn't be able to do he would have to work with someone who is a carpenter and there will always be people who want to cooperatively create things but there's also something special when an individual makes something from the ground up. Yeah. And and we we are at a point where people act like the mass produced products um in the system of objects that we we that run our lives. People do act like they're singular. Um but they're 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 not. There is a qualitative difference between the rings you and Ann got and any ring I would be able to buy anywhere else. Um, yeah. But yeah. We will be freed up to come into a relationship with things um, as they are rather than with things as um, as the form that they are, the, the, or the, the role that they're playing in, in the system of objects demands Mm -hmm. um and that's on our side that's a process that happens on our side like we warp our perception our understanding our relationship and our relation to things to fit the ideal of the form um right because nothing is ever um what it's actually marketed as 
However, when things right. when things are allowed to be singularly produced, it actually is that thing that it's that it is projecting. Your rings are your rings by virtue of how they were made and how they and how you acquired them and, and all that. So the that mediation mm -hmm. of that the system of objects, that's gone. And so that itself right. is more freedom. Right. God damn, dude. Yeah. Uh, going to going to Baudrillard through Gores, man. That's gonna be the project of next year. <laughs> sure. Once once Mikey's once Mikey's book is out, dude. that'll be the project of next year. It's gonna be the shit. The depersonalization, standardization, and division of labor constitute the prerequisites to both a reduction of working hours and its desirability. Each individual's work can be reduced because others are also capable of doing it. And it should be reduced so that each individual may do other, more personally satisfying and fulfilling things. In other words, the heteronymous nature of work, which is the consequence of its socialization and increased productivity, is also what makes the liberation of time in the expansion of, an auto of autonomous activity both possible and desirable. It is a dangerous illusion to believe that workers' control can make everyone's work gratifying, intellectually stimulating, and personally fulfilling. I think that might be a sore... Sore point for some people. That's that is one of those quotes we, we should put in the receipts oh, doc. It's not OCR. Did I share that with you? Yeah, I was. But just, seriously, it's not. I was just trying to grab it, or maybe it's the reader I'm using. When I'm on my computer, I could, uh, which no, I'll that... do once I'm done with these dishes. I could probably OCR it. I've got Adobe Acrobat. I don't know why it's... OCR OCR is how you make it so that you can copy text people by the way if anybody's wondering what that's all about Hold on let me let me check Google I think it is OCR I thought so too uh I'm I'm reading it in Edge um it might just be which is weird Edge is usually good I a different edition I like hold on I'm I have it open in Google Docs right now. Let me see. But yeah, that quote definitely needs to go in the So and context for why that matters is because this is why there can be no working class going from being in itself to for itself. The idea is like it there is a working class in itself. There are people who own no means of production, control no means of production, and spend their whole life having their time energy collapsed into labor power that then has to be exchanged on the market. And then supposedly the only alternative for getting out of that reality is to have a bureaucratically controlled uh, society that tells you where to work for how long to work. Or even if you have a little bit more choice over the matter, you still are considered a worker as you know, by the, by the society at large. That's how you are seen. And then if it's a socialist society or even a fascist society, that's how you are represented. Oh, you're a worker? We represent the interests of the workers. And the issue is, is that there's a fundamental contradiction between the interests of workers who want out of work because it's killing them and people who find pride and meaning and identity in the work that they are doing. And the people who find pride and meaning and identity in the work that they are doing are usually higher skilled. And of course, we have like these, everyone on every construction site or, 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 or warehouse in the world knows that they have coworkers who are like, this is who I am. This is what I do. And they're fucking idiots. And no, no, and I'm sorry, I don't want that worker's interests being the, the interests that are being centered by whatever the society is that we're living in. But that is exactly the workers' interest being uh, represented in Soviet Russia and uh, Nazi Germany or fucking uh, Mussolini's Italy. And, and at the, I, I want to be sympathetic, at least on, on one level, and that's to say that workers have been shut out of society. They had no civic rights. Um, and so getting them rights and recognition and representation, all of that mattered in the same way that it matters for ethnic minority groups. But the person who, once they get those basic rights, wants to make that their whole fucking 
life and then use that to engage with everybody else all the time is 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 insufferable. I don't give a shit. And and the worker who's like, yeah, I'm an Amazon worker. It's just bitch, shut the fuck up. Yeah, you're a, you're an Amazon worker. Good job. You mean your life is being your life force is being sucked away and you've got no interesting skills. You're a boring human being. And the most interesting thing you probably have is a video game you play at home. You're being robbed of a future and you're telling you're selling that to everyone as like something you're proud of. It's 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 I get it. You're, you're you're working with necessity and you're trying to not hate yourself and hate your life. And so you're putting a positive twist on it. But don't fall for the leaders or representatives who tell you. They represent your interests because they're going to make sure that, you know, you've got a reliable job or whatever. Yeah. Those. So the point is, is like th- this fundamental contra- this, this quote, which I'll have you reread here in a second. The point of it, I, what I'm taking from it is that this gets to a fundamental contradiction in the interests um, between workers within the working class. There are those who see how stultifying it is and feel like it's killing them. And then there are those who feel like, oh, this is great. It could just be slightly better. Yeah. Which, by the way, I just call that reformism. Mm-hmm. They're workerist reformists. And you can have revolutionary workerist reformists. You can have revolutionary leftist, socialist or anarchist, uh, workerist reformists. Right. But that comes from people who who have found this strong identification with their work, and they can't imagine a non job centric society. All right, I'm trying to. Any luck? Well, I'm converting it to an EPUB with caliber. Um, because it I did. I don't know if it's probably my computer because it was OCR because we were reading it with Speechify and it like right. w- wasn't fucked up. But like I can't get Google or Edge. Is it there? Is it that there's multiple versions of this document? There might be. Um, and Caliber's taking fucking forever right now. Anyway, that quote uh, we can yeah let we'll keep moving, but that quote definitely needs to go. So I'll read it again. So you put your, yeah, read it again. I'll write down on my quote sheet here so I can word search it later. In other words, the heteronymous nature of work, which is the consequence of its socialization and increased productivity, is also what makes the liberation of time and the expansion of autonomous activity both possible and desirable. It is a dangerous illusion to believe that workers' control can make everyone's work gratifying intellectually stimulating and personally fulfilling in any seven in any complex society the nature modalities and objectives of work are to a large extent determined by necessities over which individuals or groups have relatively little control it is certainly possible to self-manage workshops or to self-determine working conditions or to co-determine the design of machines and the definition of tasks Yet, as a whole, these remain no less determined in a heteronymous way by the social process of production or, in other words, by society insofar as it is itself a giant machine. Workers' control, erroneously equated with workers' self-management, amounts in reality to self-determining the modalities of what has already been heteronymously determined. The workers will share and define tasks within the framework of an already existing social division of labor. They are not, however, able to define the division of labor itself, nor, for example, the specifications of ball bearings. They may eliminate the degrading characteristics of work, but they cannot endow it with the characteristics of personal creativity. What is at issue, then, is a form of alienation inherent not only in capitalist relations of production, but in the socialization of the process of production itself, in the workings of a complex, machine-like society. The effects of this alienation can be attenuated, but never entirely eliminated. The consequences of this situation are not entirely negative, provided that is ineradicable reality is accepted, provided that its ineradicable reality is accepted. 
Above all, it must be recognized that there can never be a complete identity between individual individuals and their socialized work, and, inversely, that socialized work cannot always be a form of personal activity in which individuals find complete fulfillment. Socialist morality, with its injunction that each individual be completely committed to his or her work and equate it with personal fulfillment, is oppressive and totalitarian at root. That one as well. Oh my god, dude. Hold on. All right, I'm going to stop because now my computer's having a goddamn heart attack. Socialist morality. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't turn the fucking microphone back on because my hands were wet. But okay, so it's uh, at root is going to be the search yeah. term. Yeah. At, so I'm just going to like dangerous illusion at root. Each of these is a quote and we only need like significant words from the quote to be able to pull it later. Yeah. Socialist morality with its injunction that each individual be completely committed to his or her work and equate it with personal fulfillment is oppressive and totalitarian at root. It is a morality of accumulation, which mirrors the morality of the bourgeoisie in the heroic age of capitalism. It equates morality with love of work, while at the same time depersonalizing work through the processes of industrialization and socialization. In other words, it calls for love of depersonalization, or self-sacrifice. It rejects the very idea of the free development as each individual as the goal and precondition of the free development of all. And that's Marx. It sets itself against the ethic of the liberation of time, which originally dominated the working class movement. If individuals are to be reconciled with their work, it must be recognized that, even under workers' control, work is not and should not be the center of one's life. It should be only one point of reference. The liberation of individuals and society, together with the regression of wage labor and commodity-based relationships, requires the domination of autonomous over heteronymous activity. In describing the non-class of non-workers as the potential social subject of the abolition of work, I am not claiming to put in place the working class as defined by Marx, another class invested with the same type of historical and social mission. The working class defined by Marx or Marxists derives its theological character from being perceived as a subject transcending its members. It makes history and builds society through the agency of its unwitting members, whatever their intentions. The working class thus defined is a transcendent subject by which the workers are thought in their true being, but it remains unthinkable for the workers themselves, just as our body is unthinkable for the millions of its component cells, or God is unthinkable for God's creatures. This is why the working class had and still has its priests, prophets, martyrs, churches, popes, and wars of religion. The non-class of those who are recalcitrant to the sacralization of work, on the contrary, is not a social subject. It has no transcendent unity or mission, and hence, no overall conception of history and society. It has, so to speak, no god or religion, no reality other than that of the people who compose it. In short, it is not a class but a non-class. For this very reason, it has no prophetic aura. It is not the harbinger of a new subject society offering integration and salvation to its individual members. Instead, it reminds individuals of the need to save themselves and define a social order compatible with their goals and autonomous existence. This is the specific characteristic of all nascent social movements. Like the peasant movement, the Protestant Reformation, and subsequently the working class movement itself, the movement formed by all those who refuse to be nothing but workers has very strong libertarian overtones. It is a negation and rejection of law and order, power and authority, in the name of the inalienable right to control one's own life. 9. Of course, 
this right can only be affirmed if it corresponds to a power that individuals derive from their own existence rather than their integration in soci into society. In other words, from their own autonomy. The building up of this autonomous power is, in the present phase, the central concern of the nascent movement. Since it is a fragmented and composite movement, it is by nature refractory toward organization, programming, the delegation of functions, or its integration into an already established political force. This is at once its strength and its weakness. It is its strength because a different kind of society, opening up new spaces of autonomy, can only emerge if individuals set out from the very beginning to invent and implement new relationships and forms of autonomy. Any change in society presupposes an extra-institutional process of cultural and ethical change. No new liberties can be granted from above by institutionalized power unless they have already been taken and put into practice by people themselves. In the early phase of a movement... Which is, which is, which is probably in one of the other really important uh, threads here. So let's... Can you put your cursor by that quote? Let's see it. There we go. No new liberties. Because that's where is it? Your mouse is not moving. Oh, okay. No new liberties can be granted from above by institutionalized power unless they have already been taken and put into practice by people themselves. That is why time energy theory is a form of hyperstition. Mm -hmm. And it is actually something that if we don't have our time energy to do what we're doing with these hub events, then people can't, can't, people can't realize what's possible with time energy. Right. Right. So yeah, that's, I, that's killer. I'm going to add that to a section called hyperstition. Um, in, in that sense, it's like, it's a concept of the future and it's a, and it's a value of any society that could be, could could ever call itself free right no new liberties hey got it in the early phase of a movement its suspicion toward institutions and established parties is a reflection of its reluctance to pose problems in traditional ways or to accept without question that debates on the management of the state by political parties or the management of society by the state are the last word on anything it is its weakness, however, because spaces of autonomy captured from the existing social order will be marginalized, subordinated, or ghettoized unless there is a full transformation and reconstruction of society, its institutions, and its legal systems. It is impossible to envisage the predominance of autonomous activities over heteronomous work in a society in which the logic of commodity production, profitability, and capitalist accumulation remains dominant. The predominance of autonomous activities is thus a political matter as well as an ethical and existential choice. Its realization presupposes not only that the movement is able to open up new spaces of autonomy through its practice, but also that society and its institutions, technologies, and legal systems can be made compatible with an expanded sphere of autonomy. The process of transforming society in accordance with the aims of the movement will certainly never be an automatic effect of the expansion of the movement itself. It requires a degree of consciousness, action, and will. In other words, it requires politics. The fact that the post-capitalist, post-industrial, post-socialist society envisaged here cannot and should not be as integrated, ordered, and planned as preceding societies have been does not make it possible to dispense with the problem of defining the workings juridical basis, and institutional balance of power to be found in this society. The footnote on that. In the traditional Marxist schema, socialism is a transitional stage toward communism. During this transition, the development and socialization of the productive forces is to be completed, wage labor to be retained and even extended. The abolition of wage labor, at least as the dominant form of work, and market relations is, according to the schema, to be realized with the advent of communism. In advanced industrial societies, socialism is already historically obsolete, as was recognized in the theses of the Manifesto Group in Italy in 1969. 
political tasks have now gone beyond the question of socialism and should turn upon the question of communism as it was originally defined. The use of these terms is made difficult by the perversion and devaluation of the notions of socialism and communism by regimes and parties that claim to represent them. The crisis of Marxism, which is reflected in these difficulties, should not, however, lead to forsaking analysis of capitalism, socialism, their crises, and what lies beyond. The conceptual apparatus of Marxism is irreplaceable, and it would be as childish to reject it wholesale as to consider capital, despite its unfinished and luxuriant condition, as revealed truth. That's a banger footnote, too. However, yeah, man, that's really good. Yeah. However, non integrated, diverse, complex, pluralist, pluralistic, and libertarian it may be, it will still remain one among a number of possible choices of society and will have to be realized by conscious action. I do not know what form this action will take or which political force might be able to take it. I only know that this political force is necessary and that its relationship with the movement will be, and should be, as strained and conflictual as was that between the anarcho-syndicalist anarcho trade union movement and the political parties of the working class. The subordination of the one to the other has always led to the bureaucratic sterility of both, especially when political parties have confused politics with control of the state apparatus. I have therefore deliberately left this question open and unresolved. In the present phase, we must dare to ask questions we cannot answer and to raise problems whose solution remains to be found. Andre Gores, 1980, December 1980. So that was the preface, the nine theses on... Uh, what, what was it? Oh, my computer's being crazy, dude. Okay. Yeah, man, if we were trying to reduce heteronymous labor instead of capitalize off of it, then, and blur the lines between heteronomy and these other realms of labor, then we would not have computers that are so clunky that it's just these, you know, <laughs> the, 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 this is planned obsolescence. Yes. They're the, the whole speeding up of everything constantly so that by the time you get 5g, it's actually slower than 4g because now the videos and the data exchange is like higher than it ever was. It's like, that is not necessary. That is not socially necessary. And there is this, weird Marxist way of saying that everything that is, is socially necessary labor. And it just, it eradicates like real distinctions. And there's a real distinction between having a functional fucking computer and uh, this arms race mm -hmm. to make the data collection on us faster. Yeah. That makes, and even, even, even if that was socially necessary and we just, and that, that was part of heteronymous labor, if it was decided so, then we could at least have uh, more exchangeable parts. You just you just click this button, pop this part off, you know, throw it away, donate it, whatever, replace it with a new piece. And uh, you know, there's there, there's there's just cars that used to be built this way, uh, paintball guns that are made this way, and there's the the overwhelming majority are not made this way, and it is because of the production of waste. Yep. Yeah. And I'm just, I just, I, every time I'm getting angry with the computer, which has been a lot lately, it's just, it just makes me angrier about the way we produce things. Motorola made phones like that for a while, modular phones that, um, it wasn't so much about repairability, but it was about like, you buy this platform and then you you put a camera module on it or you put an extended memory module or you put a bigger battery like it was pretty cool but they that phone failed 
in the market. Um, and I think, I think it was only due to the marketing because it was actually a really good idea and it was very useful for people. But I think Motorola just stopped supporting it because they realized they could make more money by forcing people to buy an entirely new phone every time they wanted new functionality. But there are, again, there are things that you can buy and they tend to be more boutique things that are very utilitarian. They're like, or tools. Like when you, when you buy cheap tools, um, you don't really get so much. But like if you're spending a fuckload of money on a hyper-specific tool, they are very repairable. They're very modular. They're very, like they're built to be used. But most, right. most things are built to be ultimately replaced. Like, right. So. Tools is a good example because it's like Husqvarna and uh, Steel are two brands you cannot go wrong with. Those are all modular, all replaced. The batteries for one works for all the rest. Um, they're they're made to last as long as possible. They're meant to be like shockproof and everything. But if you buy an off brand from Walmart, it is a piece of shit. Yeah, it you is get a re- terrible piece of shit. Yeah, Ryobi or or whatever. Like they're built to be replaced. Oh, re- yeah, Ryobi is amazing too. Yeah, my dad loves that shit. Um, and yeah, so actually, those are the three main brands I think. So if and then I was going to say like REI, um, everything made for outdoor wear and tear and use in the mountains for mountaineering is fucking quality. So people talk a lot of shit about Patagonia because it's like Patagucci. Ooh, it's like this upper middle class whole food shopper granola thing. It is sign value. Mm. People buy all kinds of Pat- Patagonia that they do not need and they wear it during times when they don't need to. In the same way that we do uh, Carhartt, you know, yep. and Carhartt is better. The Carhartt beanie is not better, but the Carhartt uh, suspenders are better uh, or overalls. They are better than, um, you know, run of the mill uh, overalls. Okay. My point though is it's basically like solidly middle class or upper middle class products that are kind of boutique consumer goods do tend to be the exact kind of shit that we, that everyone needs. And uh, if you're living paycheck to paycheck, uh, you're closed out of that. And so for instance, you can only afford clothes that lose value really quickly. Um, And so I grew up with shoes that would fall apart on me all the time. Um, I grew up with like, clothes that just like were really thin and, and lose and they 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 become you have to throw them out not after not too long and a lot of it was hand-me-downs and secondhand store stuff but um when we got new clothes they were from walmart and they're garbage so i don't know it just it's upsetting that 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 that's not just the norm That these companies like Walmart have stepped in to provide um, all these socially necessary goods that are built to fail as fast as fucking possible. So, yeah. Yeah, it's actually in the long run, it's, it's more expensive to be poor than it is to have enough money to buy something good in the first place. Mm hmm. Now, do you want to take a do you want to take a break and have me read the introduction or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, because I think I should pull it up here and do the screen share so that you don't have to be bounded to the chair. I'll do the computer setup once uh, the introduction is over. Uh, but yeah, this way you can eat something or whatever. I just cleaned all those dishes from the Tillamook. Oh, that sucks, I think dude. You muted. Yeah. Yeah. Were they but like, hey, I finally got it. Yeah. Were they fucked up? No, they were fine. No, I put them in that Tupperware and filled it with hot water a couple of days ago, and it was some stinky ass water. 
but I just stayed away from it and I dumped it all out and then I filled it up again. I just basically put it through a couple of rinses before I got to washing it. So I didn't have to deal with any of the grossness. So yeah, everybody historically, like what's going on is uh, we both just got done with tour. And so uh, we did some camping on tour with Anne. We used some dishes. Those dishes stayed dirty because we were just busy, 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 going, going, going. It was all closed up in a bin so we didn't have to think about it or look at it but anyway i'm trying to open this document and i think i think it's trying to open in the background but maybe i didn't click it right adobe acrobat just takes forever to launch i think it's trying to launch it in adobe acrobat Yeah, let's try to open it in Chrome instead. All right, if you can stop sharing the screen. I'll start sharing the screen. So what do you all think about that so far, listeners? I know that a couple of people at least are going to listen to this. I'm curious who listens to this. I want to know if you listen to it. Do let me know. Even if you're Bauer and you never comment, do let me know. Like, send me a message. Be like, yo, I listened to that. That preface read by Nance. That was interesting. Um, Swole, I'm definitely curious what you think of all of this. Now that you have left the international Marxist tendency but still consider yourself a Trotskyist. I hope that this will help you understand a little bit why uh, Trotsky could never represent the interests of the workers because there were always workers who didn't want to have to work. <laughs> who did, and, you know, Trotsky considered them traitors, right? Like, like, oh, they don't understand like their necessary role. And I could I could get why you thought I could get why he thought that and I could be sympathetic to him, but I have a lot more trouble being sympathetic to uh, keeping that alive right now, at a time when it's like, well, Amazon has more radical imagination than the left. Like Amazon is more progressive than the left. Bezos is more forward looking than the left. Because he is for automation. Now, of course, he's not, it's not, it's not good. But at least it's developing automation. And it's crazy that like there's this humanist tendency um, on the left that denigrates automation and says that automation is the enemy. Um, a, and then at the same time complains about how there's a lack of radical imagination. It's like, really? Yeah, I agree there is a lack of uh, radical imagination. But um, Rhea Donescu, uh, I can't ever say her name, but Rhea, the author of uh, yeah, Marxism and Freedom, I think is what it's called. Rhea Donescu, she thinks that this left tendency to see automation as good is itself like out of touch with the workers the workers don't want automation the workers don't want to stop working and i guess my thing is our thing our thing is she's just she's picking and choosing which workers she pays attention to and she's taking these humble simple people who would probably work and fit into any society. And she's taking them to be the workers that we should listen to, as opposed to the workers who are like, no, fuck this shit, man. I want a life outside of my job. I don't know if this laptop's even going to work, man, but I did get it up on the screen. I just can't even, I, I keep clicking onto, oh, there we go. The document, it's just like, it's so laggy. It's killing me. Here, I'm going to pause my recording. See if that helps. 
and then resume once I get down to the part that we're supposed to be. Oh, the pause option is gone. Thanks a lot, OBS. There used to be a pause recording option. Whatever, people can skip ahead if they want to. This is not functional. I'm just swiping and it's not responding. Okay. Kind of functional. Here we go. Now this is where the metal, I guess rubber hits the road and the, the metal, the heavy, the metal core, like sort of bass drop comes in. This is like, all of that was kind of just like his preface. He just wanted to make sure nobody misses the memo as far as like what his deal is. But this is the introduction. This is really where this book begins. And he comes out swinging. So let's go. Introduction. There's a crisis in Marxist thinking because a crisis has developed within the labor movement. Over the past 20 years, the link between the development of the productive forces and the growth of class antagonism has been broken. This does not mean that the internal contradictions of capitalism are not considerable. They have never been more spectacular. Capitalism has never been less able to solve the problems it has generated. Yet this inability has not been fatal. Instead, capitalism has acquired a barely examined and often poorly understood capacity to manage the non-resolution of its problems. It has become able to accommodate its dysfunctions, even drawing renewed strength from the state of affairs. Hey, puppy. For the problems it has found to be insoluble are also intrinsically insoluble. They will remain so even when the political organizations of the working class come to control the mechanisms of state power. They will remain insoluble for as long as the mode, the forces, and the relations of production retain their present form. Based and moish pistone pilled, I would say. The whole point of time, labor, and social domination is a critique of that right there. The mode forces and relations of production being put under worker management does not change the game. And I think it was Bordeaux who, in his critique of Heidegger, says, Heidegger just thinks that Soviet Russia is worker-controlled capitalism. And he says that like it's a diss. And I'm like, actually, that's pretty good. Yeah, what's the problem? Who and what can change them? As in who and what can change the mode, forces, and relations of production? This question lies at the core of the present crisis of the Marxist tradition. The tradition is based upon a number of interconnected assumptions, which will remain unverified in the future as they have been in the past. Okay. They are... Okay, so these are the unverifiable assumptions that are interconnected that we could say are the essential, unverifiable, therefore unscientific, assumptions of worldview Marxism, or what we say when we say orthodox worldview Marxism, or traditional Marxism. First, the development of the forces of production will create the material base for the establishment of socialism, right? Two, the development of the forces of production will create the social preconditions for the establishment of socialism in the form of a working class collectively capable of taking over and managing the forces of production whose development brought it into being. Reality is quite different in fact, one, the development of the productive forces is functional exclusively to the logic and needs of capital. Their development will not only fail to establish the material preconditions of socialism, but are an obstacle to its realization. The productive forces called into being by capitalist development are so profoundly tainted by their origins that they are incapable of accommodation to a, social, a socialist rationality. 
should a socialist society be established, they will have to be entirely remolded. Thus, any theory assuming the continued functioning of the existing productive forces will be automatically incapable of developing or even perceiving a socialist rationality. And then I would just add, yeah, so if we're talking about ball bearings and computer processors, um, then sure, like that does lay the conditions for some kind of post-scarcity and more equal society where everyone's able to save a lot of time because we have computer chips and ball bearings and bolts and nuts and stuff being produced for less than pennies on the dollar. That'd be great. Um, but that's not the mode of production that we currently have. Like, yeah, we do get those from this mode of production, but we also get a hundred billion other things that are not necessary that aren't built in a way so as to save time, but are built in a way so as to siphon off surplus value, which is to say, take away your time, energy in the week and make it something someone else can stockpile and then trade on Wall Street. That's facts. Two, the productive forces that have developed in capitalist society do not lend themselves either to direct appropriation by the collective worker who sets them to work or the collective appropriation by the proletariat as a whole. In fact, capitalist development has produced a working class which, on the whole, is unable to take command of the means of production and whose immediate interests are not con consonant with a socialist rationality. And that's to the other point. My example I was just using about ball bearings and such I was saying, well, we make a hundred billion other things that aren't necessary or aren't built to last, but how are they made? And what are the relations of production necessary for how they are currently made? They could be made in other ways, but the current way they are made is made in such a way so that one person does the labor of 20 other people, but has to work full time and therefore doesn't get to have a soul, doesn't get to have a family, doesn't get to, has nothing but a hollowed out remains of a household, of a community, right? And so this working class that develops in that in those conditions is not a class in any way, shape or form that could ever go from being in itself to for itself, but is instead shards of broken people who are habituated to loving their oppression or if they don't love it have found a million other ways of interpreting it outside of class and no amount of going around telling people they're a part of something is going to change what they empirically see every day which is that it's everybody for themselves or clicked up into small groups of three to five this is the present state of affairs capitalism has called it into being a working class, or more loosely, a mass of wage earners whose interests, capacities, and skills are functional to the existing productive forces, which themselves are functional solely to the rationality of capital. Thus, the eradication of capitalism and its transcendence in the name of a different rationality can only come from areas of society which embody or prefigure the dissolution of all social classes, including the working class itself. And if you're a Marxist, who doesn't think that the dissolution of the working class is the goal of Marxism, then what the fuck? Now, of course, that is, I think most people say, yeah, that's the long-term goal. That's the long-term goal. But first, the class has to come to see itself as a class. Well, it's been 150 years. How's that going? In the meantime, the workers are, once again, more progressive than you are. They see forward at least in a way that says, no, that's bullshit. Why don't we get onto it now? Get onto the next thing now. Unless you're just listening to the people who love it and love their oppression. Outside of the people who love it and love their oppression, everybody else is like, yeah, my fucking job, my fucking bullshit job. And of course, there are people who are like, oh yeah, but if your interests were represented by the worker state whose staff I would be you know, a paid member, then you're, come on, stop, stop with the, the, the plans that require us to trust you. Just stop. 
we're in post-trust society now. Let's move on. So uh, this is chapter one, the working class, according to St. Marx. He gets a little pithy, gets a little, little, little spicy. He's, uh, he's coming out guns blazing here. The working class, according to St. Marx. He's speaking to the fact that Marx is talking about Marx and Marxism like it's, uh, it is religious. And he's about to explain why it's religious. Uh, and so if you're ready to go, then Nance, I'll stop screen sharing. My computer's a piece of shit. Now I'm going to go set up my other one. And I guess I should say, I think he is one of these guys like Paul Maddock, like Michael Heinrich, who is not just a sock dem, who's not just a liberal, who's not just anything, who's profoundly disillusioned with the way Marx has been interpreted and the way a lot of these old or defunct or outgrown categories get uh, copied and pasted by people who call themselves materialists when it's pure idealism to keep doing it this way. Um, but yeah, to take pot shots at Marx in this context is not, it's not about Marx. It's about Marxism, traditional worldview Marxism. Marxists. As Michael Heinrich calls it. Marxists. And in that way, I think that they are Marx, Marxists more than Marxists because mm. Marx was not dogmatically subscribing to any one thinker. He was studying bourgeois theory and philosophy, trying to understand things scientifically and working with what he had uh, with the idea of understanding the world so as to change it. And uh, he did, you know, 15 to 20 years of interpreting before he ever said that it was time to change it. And obviously it's back to the drawing board. Now we have to understand it if we want to change it. And so does that mean adhering to old categories or does that mean reading everybody who has critiqued those old categories and then finding a new theory? We say the latter. I'll, uh, I'll uh, gonna move this around. Hold on, I'll be I'll be right back. Chapter 1, The Working Class According to St. Marx Marx's theory of the proletariat is not based upon either empirical observation of class conflict or practical involvement in proletarian struggle. No amount of empirical observation or practical involvement as a militant will lead to the discovery of the historical role of the proletariat, a role which, according to Marx, constitutes its being as a class. Marx made the point many times. Empirical investigation of the real condition of the proletariat will not disclose its class mission. On the contrary, only a knowledge of this mission will make it possible to discover the true being of the proletarians. Consequently, it is of little importance to know what proletarians think themselves think they are, and it matters little what they believe they are doing or expecting. All that matters is what they are even if their present behavior is a little mystified and their current desires somewhat at odds with their historical role, sooner or later essence will out and reason will triumph over mystification. In other words, the being of the proletariat transcends the proletarians. It is a sort of transcendental guarantee that proletarians will ultimately conform to the class line. This suggests a rather obvious question. Who is in a position to know and say what the proletariat is if proletarians themselves have only a deformed or mystified consciousness of what they truly are? Traditionally, of course, the answer has been Marx. Marx alone was able to identify... Oh, wait. Yeah. You're not screen sharing. Oh, shit. I forgot about that. I was like, wait, where is it? I wanted to look at it. Okay. Hey. Okay. 
Fuck. Based. All right. Damn it. Noise, noise, noise. Okay. Marx alone was able to identify what the being and historical role of the proletariat truly were. Their truth is to be found in Marx's works. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the founder and prophet. The answer, this answer is of course, this answer of course is not very satisfactory. Jesus. Why should Marx alone have become aware of the transcendent being of the proletariat? The question calls for a philosophical answer, but surprisingly Marx did not formulate one. We shall soon see why he could not do so. Marx's theory of the proletariat is a striking syncretism of the three major ideological currents that informed European thought during the heroic age of the bourgeois revolutions, Christianity, Hegelianism, and Scientism. The linchpin of the system was Hegelianism. Hegel had set out to show that history was a dialectical process whereby spirit, Geist, initially estranged from itself, becomes aware and takes possession of the world, which is only spirit existing outside and in separation from itself, and in doing so becomes world itself. History was seen by Hegel as a succession of sage stages, each one of which, because of its internal contradictions, inevitably gives birth to the following one until the whole process culminates in a synthesis which is at once the meaning of all previous history and the end of all history, its consummation. Thus, the true meaning of each stage is discernible only in the light of the final synthesis. But discernible to whom? Not, of course, to particular individuals responsible for a particular historical episode of whose untenable internal contradictions they are not even aware. In fact, only, uh, only Hegel was in a position to discern this meaning, for he had had the genius to see history as a process unfolding a meaning present at the end of time from where it calls upon the multitude of its alienated, mystified, aborted, and mutilated historic manifestations to transcend themselves towards it. Hegel's philosophy is Christian theology translated as theophany. History is eschatology, the end of time and the reign of God, realized by the mediation of historical agents unaware of the work of transcendence which they are accomplishing. Their consciousness matters little, because the work of history is informed by a dialectic transcending their own intentions. This is the key to Marx's dialectic. He retained the principal characteristic of the Hegelian dialectic, that history has a meaning which is independent of the consciousness of individuals and realizes itself, whatever they may think, in their actions. But this meaning, instead of walking on its head, as spirit does in Hegel, is seen by Marx as marching on the feet of the proletariat. The labor of spirit raising the world to consciousness and ultimate unity with itself was no more than the idealist delirium of a theologian wedded to rationalism. <laughs> For Marx, it is the workers, not spirit, who perform the labor of history. History is not the dialectical process of spirit taking possession of the world, but the progressive appropriation of nature by human labor. The world is not at first spirit estranged from itself, but nature hostile to human life and unresponsive to human activity. Progressively, however, society would be able to mold nature to its needs until, once mastery had been achieved, humanity would recognize itself in nature as its own product. Hello, Ryan. The obstacles impeding this recognition were twofold. Firstly, the power of the tools of production was still limited. Secondly, individuals were separated both from their tools of production and from the overall result of their collective labor. This separation and resultant alienation would only disappear with the advent of a class able to reproduce nature as a whole by means of a totality of tools from which it would be totally alienated, alienated and which it would thus have to reappropriate collectivity. It would have to and would be able to, according to Marx, 
because the means of production which had developed could not only could not be appropriated and operated by any single individual, but only by all acting together in pursuance of a common goal. Humanity would recover, in fact, create, its unity with nature when nature itself had become the work of humanity and when, by implication, the origin of humankind will be humankind itself. Communism, i.e. the advent of the proletariat as universal class, was the meaning of history. The parallel is clear. Hegel's spirit is replaced by the activity of producing the world. At first, estranged and concealed from itself, this creative activity progressively emerges to self-consciousness and, as the forces of production grow in power, is led to culminate in the Promethean self-affirmation of the collective worker as creator. Through the universal cooperation of all, of both the world and itself. The motor of history from this perspective was not the dialectical unfolding of spirit until the end of time, but the impossibility that an agent who actually produces the world should accept being dispossessed of the product and having the results of the work turned against the agent as means of subjection. This impossibility was both essential and historical. It would become manifest and effective only when the nature of both the techniques and social relations of production made it apparent that the world, stripped of its mystical veil, was the product of social labor and that, the individu and that individuals divested of their narrow activities, thanks to the socialization of labor, were the producers of the world. Capitalism, according to Marx, would ensure the realization of both these conditions. As its productive forces developed, the mysterious forces of the natural world would give way to the technicized environment and manufactured wealth of the automatic factory. In its turn, this industrial universe would call forth a class whose members no longer worked with tools of their own for their narrow self-interest as individuals. They would be divested of all particular individuality and made into interchangeable workers bringing into play a totality of immediately social capacities and technical powers in pursuance of immediately social effects. This is what the proletariat is to be, according to Marx. With its emergence, labor would become conscious of itself as the means through which humanity in the world would be realized. History would teach its accomplishment by inaugurating the reign of a human universal. It is worth noting that this theory did not grow out of empirical observation, but developed from a critical reflection carried out in reaction to Hegelianism upon the essence of labor. For the young Marx, it was not the existence of a revolutionary proletariat that justified his theory. Instead, his theory enabled him to predict the inevitable emergence of the revolutionary proletariat. The analysis was governed by philosophy. Philosophy anticipated real developments. It demonstrated that the meaning of history lay in the emergence, with the proletariat, of a universal class alone able to emancipate society as a whole. This class had to emerge if history was to be meaningful, and indeed, there were already signs of the process taking place. They were, however, only intelligible to the philosopher qua philosopher. But philosophy, specific and separate consciousness of the historical mission of the proletariat, was destined to disappear as the proletariat would become conscious of its own being and translate its mission into practice. From this point, philosophy would be incarnated by the proletariat itself. Philosophy was but an external consciousness of the proletariat's being. It would disappear when the proletariat reached self-consciousness. The philosopher's task was to pursue their self-suppression, i.e., the suppression of philosophy as a separate activity. The materialist dialectic in which pr productive activity came to awareness of itself as the source of both humanity and the world had thus to rely on a political-philosophical dialectic in which the proletariat came to internalize the consciousness of its being, which at, the outs which at the outset could only exist externally in the person of Karl Marx, and subsequently in the form of the Marxist-Leninist vanguard. 
This is where we remain. The reading of Marx outlined here is the one that generations of militants, both before and after May 68, have, consciously or not, followed. Obviously, it is an historically specific reading, drawing upon contemporary usages and points of reference and making no attempt to recover the historical itinerary of Marx's own thought with complete fidelity. Nonetheless, it is a truthful reading, one that seeks to transpose Marx's intellectual itinerary to the cultural context of the present. Like Marx, the youthful revolutionaries of the generation of May 68 have not committed themselves to the revolutionary movement and gone to work in factories because the proletariat acts, thinks, and feels in a revolutionary way, but because it is in itself revolutionary by destination, which is to say, it has to be revolutionary. It must become what it is. The philosophical stance is at, stance is at the root of all that characterize the history of revolutionary movements, vanguardism, substitutionism, elitism, and their opposites, spontaneism, tailism, trade unionism. The impossibility of any empirical verification of the theory itself has kept hanging over Marxism like original sin. Being a reversal of the Hegelian dialectic, the philosophy of the proletariat cannot expect its legitimation from the behavior of empirical proletarians or from factual developments. Instead, its role is to legitimate and explain the real meaning of events. The Hegelian imprint makes the philosopher into a prophet and philosophy into the revelation of the meaning of being. Hegel's followers could only be the high priests of Hegelianism. They have been forgotten because they rather foolishly identified with the civil servants of the state. Marx's followers have not been forgotten because the proletariat still keeps the mystery of its transcendence. It has not yet internalized its true being, nor matched its historical role. It is not yet identified with the consciousness of itself, which the Marxist, Leninist vanguard claims to embody. As a result, the vanguard remains necessarily separate from the proletariat, and since it does remain separate, no one, least of all the proletariat, is able to arbitrate the debates dividing Marxists. Since empirical verification of the theory is impossible, the various theoretical and political positions among Marxists can only find legitimation in fidelity to the dogma. Orthodoxy, dogmatism, and religiosity are not, therefore, accidental features of Marxism. They are inherent in a philosophy structured upon Hegelianism. Even if this structure was turned upon its feet, the prophetic element it contains has no other basis than the revelation that came to the mind of the prophet himself. Any attempt to find the basis of the Marxist theory of the proletariat is a waste of time. All that its various protagonists can offer is reference to the work of Marx and the word of Lenin. Invocation of the authority of the founders. The philosophy of the proletariat is a religion. It acknowledges as much of reality as it finds reassuring. Its examination of facts always starts from the following premise. Given that the proletariat is and must be revolutionary, let us examine those facts which lend support to its revolutionary will and those which frustrate it. The terms of the problem govern the inquiry into its solution. The inquiry and its results would doubtless be very different if the problem were posed in the following way. Given that the proletariat is not revolutionary, let us examine whether it is possible that it might still become so and why it has been possible to believe that it already is. Dun, dun, dun. I just want to say that anyone who is like, yeah, but you guys don't even buy into this theory of Hegelianism. Like you guys are like Zizekian pilled and blah, blah, blah. Everything we've said about Zizek's uh, interpretation of Hegel, which is also McGowan's, um is is new this understanding of hegel is the classical one marx marx's thought does develop as a reaction to that classical understanding of hegel 
So if you look at that classical understanding and go, well, that's bullshit. Why would an inversion of bullshit be any less bullshit? I guess you could think, well, if, if something is bullshit, the opposite of it might be true. Yeah, but there's a hundred billion other things that you could land on when you invert it that could also be bullshit. So I don't think Marxism is bullshit. I think there's some some good stuff there. And I think Gores would agree. That's why he still engages. But um, I just, I've always found the dictatorship of the proletariat the least convincing, not just rhetorically, not just historically, um, not just as a supposed solution to capitalism, also as a solution to supposedly everything. I just don't, I just don't find it that convincing. And this whole like historical determinism that you do get from the manifesto. Um, yeah. It's not the most, it's not the part of, val of Marx I've ever valued. I, I've never valued that part of Marx. I, I've always been like, okay, whatever, man. Whereas the part I do find interesting is capital, like the actual project. And you could say, well, that's still his uh, appropriation of dialectics, uh, which was still fundamentally flawed and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but uh, surplus value, um, socially necessary labor time, uh, the twofold nature of the commodity. Um, and really, it's more the attempt. The attempt to understand things as a whole and to work through several different fields and bring them all together to do a, crit a critique of political economy is of inherent value, right? It's, an, it's of inherent value. And then every great... Uh, thinker who tries to think of the whole um, is doing it off the shoulders of either Hegel or Marx or both. And uh, there are indispensable reference points in that way. But yeah, man, just like the actual, whenever people are like, oh yeah, well, I don't really know about Marx's theory. I just, I like Marx's politics. I'm always just like, like one dime says that, um, you know, his favorite shit, like from Marx is like the critique of the Gotha program. And then his and then the next favorite reading uh, for leftism is State and Revolution by Lenin. And it's like, that's what he means. That's what Tony means by political Marxism. And I'm just like, wow, there is not one part of Marx that's l less interesting to me because I just think that there's nothing there. There's <laughs> yeah, nothing there. Dude. Yeah. It's nothing there. And the fact that it's like, you know, he's in dialogue with these guys like Hakim. Um, these people who like see the whole history of everything up to the current moment through this Marxist lens, this lens. Mm. And I'm just like, wow. It's like, there's not a lot of theory here, but there's a whole lot of like Marxist dogmatic apologetics. And so anyway, it's a, it's a constant tug of war and question with me and the Canadians, either Tony or, or swole, um, you know, it's like, why? Why do you all go for political Marxism? I do not understand. But I don't want to just have conversations about it. I want to read these kinds of books. I want I want them to read this book, have a real conversation with me. Read Paul Maddox, Anti-Bolshevik Communism, have a conversation with me. I don't I don't like this whole like, oh, well, let's just trade our opinions. No, I'm sick of the opinions. Yeah. I'm, I'm over it. Let's get back to the books. But anyway, that's that's what I wanted to say while I was listening to this. Anything you wanted to say about that chapter or the last one? Yeah, I just, <clears throat> I love it. It it does kind of throw out all the bullshit that's frustrating. But yeah, it's, it, he's like saying, don't let Marxism get in the way of, of taking what we should take from Marx. Um, but let's, let's theorize the moment. The working class. That's one of the best things. Oh, oh, I just want to say one of the best things about guys like Marx or Heidegger or even Hegel, people who try to encompass the entire history of thought and then bring it all together into a way of understanding the entire situation right now. Yeah, it lends itself to totalization and a million other things. But guess what? It is the critiques of how they fail that like – Without going through them, the critiques of how they fail are nothing. That's why I don't think that there's a, a, such a thing as a real Derridian mm. or a real Foucauldian. I'm sorry. 
oh, you're a Foucauldian, but you don't actually read Marx and Heidegger? Shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up, you fucking poser. Fucking dipshit academic. Get that fucking shit out of your face. You fucking liar, dude. You cannot be a Foucauldian or a Derridian if you do not read Marx and Heidegger. It's impossible. It's like, these are the great system world thinkers, man. And nobody ever, like nobody gets an A for effort as much as they do. Mm. And and you want to go and like make your whole life about reading someone who critiques them, but without ever really giving the devil his due, you got to give the devil his due because not only are they not wrong about everything, but also the possibility of ever understanding something new and actually having a new symbolization or like laying the basis for a new symbolization comes from engagement with these thinkers. I'm a hundred percent yeah, like convinced of that at least. Yeah. The Myth, Chapter 2, The Myth of Collective Appropriation. In Marxist theory, the emergence of general abstract labor at the expense of artisans' individual labor is understood to be the key to the to be the key to the historic necessity of communism. So long as artisans own their tools and the products of their labor, they were able to retain individual identity, leaving their mark upon what they produced and living their work as the practical expression of a certain autonomy. Only insofar as the products of their labor become, became commodities made exclusively for sale on the market was it possible for artisans to encounter the experience of alienation. They could not control the exchange value of their products. Exchange value depended on trade channels and circuits beyond the control of any single individual and subsequently upon technical innovations which only large-scale manufacture could afford. And yet, despite their alienation as owners and vendors of the products of their labor, artisans continue to remain in control of work itself as the activities of conceiving and producing, of transforming raw materials into finished artifacts, were governed by rhythms and methods which, within limits, varied from individual to individual. Artisans were thus both able to control their own work and alienated in their role of owners and vendors. Thus, they had particular and limited interests, amounting to a desire to maintain the highest and most stable exchange value for whatever they produced. This objective presupposed a capacity to exercise monopoly, or, when this was impossible, to league together with other artisans and to have the city restrict the numbers in particular urban trades, the length of the working day, the conditions governing the sale of goods, and so on. The conditions that allowed artisans a degree of autonomous control over their work were, at the same time, a limitation of the extent of that control. As a specialist in a particular trade, an artisan was unlikely to have any interest or desire to extend that control beyond the confines of the specific trade in question. Membership of a trade implied a specific identity in a well-defined social position. As a result, Artisans had an interest in defending or improving their respective social positions rather than in calling society as a whole into question or in seeking to remodel it on a new basis. Just because they owned the tools of their trades, artisans or free laborers engaged in production for the market in the domestic system remained prisoners of particular forms of work, of particular even individual skills learned and practiced over a lifetime and of specific occupational, commercial, and local interests. According to Marx, their proletarianization would free these narrow individualities from their particular limitations. Once dispossessed of their tools and trades, separated from the products of their labor and forced to carry out predetermined amounts of work involving an impersonal socialized know-how, workers would perceive themselves as the sheer universal power of general abstract labor, i.e., of labor stripped of all particular determinations to the extent that it had become the very essence of social labor, unlinked to any individual interest, private property, need for specific objects, or relationship to any product. In other words, proletarianization will, would replace particular producers and their limited interests by a class of producers in general, who would be immediately aware of their power over the world and conscious of their capacity to produce and recreate that world and humanity itself. With the advent of the proletariat, the supreme poverty of indeterminate power would be the seed of virtual omnipotence. Since proletarians have no trades, they are capable of any kind of work. 
Since they have no particular skills, they have a universal social capacity to acquire them all. Since they are not bound to any particular work or specific production, they are in a position to appropriate them all, to take over the system of industrial production of the whole world. Since they have nothing, they are able to want everything and be satisfied with nothing less than the complete appropriation of all riches. Throughout his life, Marx was to reiterate this vocation of the proletarians to both being everything and being able to do everything, not only as a class but individually. The problem, which Marx and the subsequent Marxist tradition had then to resolve, was how the proletarians' vocation as a class would be mirrored and enacted by proletarians individually. In his first major discussion of the problem, Marx was far from clear. He states that because they had been dispossessed of everything and stripped of their humanity, proletarians, in order to safeguard their very existence, must, Marx sometimes wrote must and can, recapture their humanity in its entirety and radically transform the world. Having made this initial assertion, which may also be found in his earliest philosophical writings, Marx then went on, without further explanation, to make a second assertion, which has very different implications. Because they are nothing, he wrote, proletarians of the present day are in a position to become everything, both collectively and, above all, individually. Here is the whole section. Thus things have now come to such a pass that the individuals must appropriate the existing totality of productive forces not only to achieve self-activity, but also merely to safeguard their very existence. This appropriation is first determined by the object to be appropriated, the productive forces, which have been developed to a totality in which only exist within a universal intercourse. The appropriation of these forces is itself nothing more than the development of the individual capacities corresponding to the material instruments of production. The appropriation of a totality of instruments of production is, for this very reason, the development of a totality of capacities in the individuals themselves. This appropriation is further determined by the persons appropriating. Only the proletarians of the present day, who are completely shut off from all self-activity, are in a position to achieve a complete and no longer restricted self-activity, which consists in the appropriation of a totality of productive forces and in the development of a totality of capacities entailed by this. And that is from the German ideology. How was it possible for Marx to move from asserting an objective necessity, individuals must appropriate the existing totality of productive forces to safeguard their very existence, to the assertion of an existential capacity. Only the proletarians of the present day are in a position to achieve a complete and no longer restricted self-activity in the development of a totality of capacities. There is no answer to the question. The problem of the capacity of the proletariat to become everything in each of its members is not of the same order as the problem of the necessity for the appropriation of everything. The former belongs to philosophy. It was extrapolated from the concept of the essence of the proletariat as the universal power of labor bringing itself to self-consciousness as the origin of the world and history for which Marx, which Marx derived from Hegel. The assertion of the okay, necessity. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Well, we're yeah. sorry. Well, we're the two. Uh, so, what are these two things here we're working with? Um, how was it possible? Having everything. Yeah. Uh, how is it possible for Marx to move from asserting an object, an objective necessity? Individuals must appropriate the existing totality. Um to the assertion of an existential capacity. Only the proletarians of the present day are in a position to achieve a complete and no longer restricted self-activity in the development of a totality of capacities. I'm confused by, by what these two statements are saying. And I know that this is crucial for this whole section. So it's like... So Marx is, Marx is calling out a need. Individuals must appropriate the existing totality. Right. Um... And he's just and then uh, he's just positing that they have the capability to do this. Only the proletarians uh, of the present day are in a position to achieve in the development of a totality of longer restricted self activity. Like he's he's saying because they well, need to, they can. I think that the reason this matters 
and maybe Gore's, I don't think Gore says this here because I'm remembering that he doesn't say this. I'm, I'm pretty sure he's not, I think that he needs to pay it, like Gore's needs to appreciate the debate on the ground at the time, which is who is the revolutionary subject. Now, it's a conversation I think we're all tired of because we just go, look, there's not a group of people that exist out there that we have to go to and try to radicalize. That's a that's a huge issue with like the online left, the actual existing left, the new left, the old left. Everybody's always like, oh, there's some people. Oh, it's black trans women in fucking wheelchairs. It's them. No, 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 no. It's a blue collar white dude. Dude, shut the fuck up. You don't know a person based on their social category. That's the thing. You just don't know a person based on their social category. You do you don't. Whether it's a group, whether it's a class, it doesn't matter. You don't know the persons. But but outside of our exasperation with that debate, it was new at the time. And so people were thinking, no, there's a revolutionary subject. It's the it's the peasants. No, it's not the peasants. It's the bourgeoisie no it's not the bourgeoisie it's the proletariat so there's this whole argument because for a while it was the bourgeoisie during the Mm -hmm. bourgeois revolutions right it was and and the idea of the bourgeoisie was not just oh the ruling class no it was the new ruling class which was coming from the middle class which was the uh you know the bourgeoisie it means the productive people basically and of course there was a as catrone says a contradiction within the movement because productive people are divided between owners and workers, but that that contradiction did not ra- raise its head until during the French Revolution. But be- but before the French Revolution, the bourgeois revolutions had kind of lumped workers and bourgeoisie together, and yeah. so you know they they had to rethink who is the revolutionary subject. And it's just like, well, okay, if we have a problem with the idea that there is a subject of history or a subject of the motor force of history. Then of course we have a problem with that. But if you're taking that debate seriously at the time, the reason I want to dignify it is because there's something smart about what Marx is doing that Gores doesn't touch on. And that is that the proletariat, not only are they able to do any kind of job, like kind of like they're they're the only people in society kind of capable of kind of taking on almost any kind of job. Just give them a little bit of training and they can do it. Plug and play. But more importantly, as a class, whereas, you know, if, if, in, if in solidarity, all the proletarians step away from the means of production, the world stops working. Rich people stop getting what they want. The military machine breaks down. Everything breaks down. Nobody, therefore, no group of people stands in a better position vis-a-vis the levers of power. Because if the real levers of power are not things that rulers say and commands that they give soldiers, but instead the real levers of power are those means of production, then it's true. It does follow that nobody except for proletarians are in that position. And it's what I've liked about the idea of like the working class is like the working class are still the people with their hands on the things. They still make the things. They they still have a little bit more power to stop things. You can get any college students and go stop a freeway, right? All that does is piss everyone off and they go, fuck these college students. But when workers themselves step away from things, that's a big deal. That's important. And it matters. And the issue is uh, that the proletarians of the time, as opposed to regular workers now, um, are very fucking different. They're different in their form. They're different in their mode. Um, And yeah, but I just want to say like at the time it made sense. It made sense because they were dispossessed of having any property they were lined up outside of factories, practically in bread lines. Charles Dickens' world, they it was easy to see that they had a common cause. And it was easy to see that not only do they have a common cause, all oppressed people have a common cause. But these, this specific category of oppressed people could step back and the world stopped. Most oppressed people step back and nobody notices. Like, like oh, well, how about just like black people step away for a day? Well, where I live, that wouldn't make a difference. Where a lot of people live, that wouldn't make a difference. If you lived in Georgia, you would notice, okay? But the point is, is like, uh, would things stop working? Would the world machine stop working? Would it grind to a halt 
if all disabled people everywhere said, we're not going to do anything for a day. No, it wouldn't. And so that's the point. It's like a lever of power uh, relation. And, uh, and to a large degree, that's been undermined by Taylorism and, uh, and by the actual existing unions of today. But I just want to say I'm, I'm on Marxist side if, if I'm situating myself in the historical debate at that time. I just think the times have changed. Yeah. Hold on, I'm trying to print shit. All right. Cool. Want me to read for a second? Yeah, well, no, hold on. Only the proletarians of the present day are in a position to achieve a complete and no longer restricted self-activity in the development of a totality of capacities. But yeah, there's no answer to the question. The problem of the capacity of the proletariat is to become anything in each of its members is not of the same order as the problem of the necessity for the appropriation of everything. The former belongs to philosophy. It was extrapolated from the concept of the essence of the proletariat as the universal power of labor, bringing itself to self-consciousness as the origin of the world and history, which Marx derived from Hegel. The assertion of the necessity for the appropriation of everything, on the other hand, was the result or apparent result of an analysis of the historical process of proletarianization. This analysis was not, however, able to establish any basis for the initial philosophical postulate. Base. Closer examination makes the following point clear. Marx's initial philosophical conviction was that the proletariat as a whole, and each proletarian in particular, must be able to take control of the totality of productive forces in order to develop the totality of its capacities. This was a necessity if the proletariat was to stand up to its essence. Subsequent analysis of the historical process was carried out in light of the initial conviction. Marx described the process of proletarianization in such a way as to show that it would produce a proletariat conscious of its being, that is to say, forced by vital necessity to become what it is to be. The historical analysis was so weak, however, that it was incapable of factually supporting the thesis it was designed to underpin. At his conclusion, Marx had returned to his point of departure and had failed to develop an analysis which substantially enriched his initial intuition. This occurred because, at the time it was developed, there was no factual evidence to support the initial idea. The majority of the proletariat consisted of dispossessed peasants and artisans. Work in the manufactures, mines, and workshops was carried out mainly by women and children. Adam Smith drew attention to the fact that many manufacturers preferred to employ semi-imbeciles, and in Capital, Marx himself described work in manufactures and in so-called automatic factories as mutilation of the physical and mental faculties of workers. Factories produced monsters individuals incapable of any independent act, stunted and crippled people, governed by an, an entirely military discipline. In short, factories produced the opposite of the ideal proletarian able to master a totality of productive forces and find complete personal fulfillment in no longer restricted self-activity. Only some ten years after the publication of the German ideology, when faced with the presence of a new stratum of skilled and polyvalent workers who were to become the protagonists of anarcho-syndicalism, did Marx, in the Grundrisse, think it possible to discover the material foundation of the proletarian capacity of self-emancipation and self-management. He anticipated a process in which the development of the productive forces would result in the replacement of the army of unskilled workers and laborers and the conditions of military discipline in which they worked by a class of polytechnic, manually and intellectually skilled workers who would have a comprehensive understanding of the entire work process, control, con 
complex technical systems and move with ease from one type of work to another. The despotism of the factory, the officers and sergeants of production would disappear. Even the bosses would come to be seen as superfluous parasites, and the moment would come when the associated producers would run both the factories and society. Capital's ceaseless striving toward the general form of wealth drives labor beyond the limits of its natural paltriness and thus creates the material elements for the development of the rich individuality which is all cited in its production as in its consumption and whose labor also therefore appears no longer as labor but as the full development of activity itself in which natural necessity in its direct form has disappeared because a historically created need has taken the place of the natural one. And that's the Grundrisse. Marx took up this theme on several occasions, notably in the critique of the Gotha program. He was convinced that the figure of the polytechnic worker embodied it the reconciliation of the individual proletarian with the proletariat, a flesh and blood incarnation of the historical subject. He was wrong. So too have been all those who have thought that the refinement and automation of production technology would lead to the elimination of unskilled work, leaving only a mass of relatively high-skilled technical workers, comparable or capable by their comprehensive understanding of technico-economic processes of taking production under their own control. We know now that exactly the opposite has occurred. Automation and computerization have eliminated most skills and possibilities for initiative and are in the process of replacing what remains of the skilled labor force, whether blue or white collar, by a new type of unskilled worker. The age of the skilled workers, with their power in the factory and their anarcho syndicalist projects, has now to be seen as but an interlude which Taylorism, scientific work organization, and finally computers and robots will have brought to a close. More than anyone anticipated, capital has succeeded in reducing workers' power in the productive process. It has been able to combine a gigantic increase in productive power with the destruction of workers' autonomy. It has been able to entrust ever more complex and powerful mechanized processes to the care of workers with ever more limited capacities. It has succeeded to the extent that those who were once called upon to take command of the giant machinery of modern industry have been dominated by, and in, the work of domination which they were to accomplish. It has simultaneously increased the technical power and capacities of the proletariat as a whole and the impotence of proletarians themselves, whether as individuals, teams, or work groups. Both the unity of the proletariat and the nature of work as the source of its universal power now lie outside and beyond the consciousness of proletarians. The collective power of a class able to produce the world and its history has not been transformed into a subject conscious of itself in each of its individual members. The class that collectively is responsible for developing and operating the totality of the productive forces is unable to appropriate or subordinate this totality to its own ends by recognizing it as the totality of its own means. In a word, the collective worker remains external to the living workers. Capitalist development has endowed the collective worker with a structure that makes it impossible for real flesh and blood workers either to recognize themselves in it, to identify with it, or to internalize it as their own reality and potential power. This has happened because the collective worker, structured by the capitalist division of labor, and adapted to the inert requirements of the machinery it serves, has come to function like a machine, just as armies do. From the very beginning, the language of industry has been a military language. The technical subordination of the workmen to the uniform motion of the instruments of labor and the peculiar composition of the body of work people, consisting as it does of individuals of both sexes and of all ages, give rise to a barrack discipline which is elaborated into a complete system in the factory and brings the previously mentioned labor of superintendents to its fullest development, thereby dividing the workers into manual laborers and overseers, into the private soldiers and NCOs of an industrial army. This specific characteristic of an army is, however, 
that each unit and group of units is wholly external to the individual soldier, like the attacking force of a cavalry squadron or the defensive force of an infantry regiment, the force of the collective worker belongs to no one. Worse, the organizational structure of the collective worker, devised and created from the outside as it has been, is no more manageable or controllable for individuals or groups of workers than an army's plan of campaign is manageable for the members of a military squad. Thus, proletarians both are and are not the collective worker just as soldiers both are and are not the army which maneuvers, advances in a pincer movement, and breaks through in a surprise attack. They are an army in the eyes of the general officer in command, whose strategic plan is then broken down into hundreds of separate orders and instructions to hundreds of commanders of smaller units. Seen from the summit, an army resembles an intelligent animal with a single head commanding thousands of arms and legs. But the animal does not exist for itself. The unit commanders and individual soldiers are ignorant of both the overall strategic plan and the entire movement of the army. All that they know are the orders and local partial movements whose overall meaning escapes them. Just as soldiers are unable to internalize the collective soldier, which is the army, whatever the goals to which it might be put, and subordinate its operations to their common will, neither can workers internalize the collective worker and subordinate the social process of production to their control. The obstacle to which we will return is not the hierarchical structure of the collective worker in itself, but those elements which make such a hierarchy necessary, namely the scale of productive units, their interdependence, and the technical, social, and regional division of labor they embody. In short, it is impossible to see the overall process in its entirety and to get the overall goal that is built into the workings of this gigantic machinery internalized by each individual and reflected in everyone's work. And this impossibility has, of course, been deliberately created in order to guarantee capitalist domination. The externality and exteriority of the collective worker in relation to particular workers is thus inherent in the material structure of the productive apparatus and in the nature of the physical processes it governs. The fact that Lenin was an enthusiast of Taylorism and Trotsky, when in power, a partisan of the militarization of labor was not just the result of specific historical circumstances. In their eyes, there was nothing incompatible between a hierarchical and highly fragmented division of labor and the undiluted power of the proletariat. So accustomed were they to thinking of the proletariat as something entirely distinct to the point of being separate from proletarians themselves. Indeed, Marx's theory has never been particularly clear about who precisely was to carry out the collective appropriation of the means of production, or about what, where, and by whom the emancipatory power conquered by the working class was to be exercised. It has also never defined the nature of the political mediations able to endow social cooperation with its voluntary character. Neither has it identified the relationship between individual workers and the collective worker, or between proletarians and the proletariat. Marx dealt with these matters only in philosophical terms in his early writings, and on that level they could appear to be soluble, at least in principle. All that was required was to treat the proletariat as an entity existing in and for itself, in the manner of Hegel's spirit, and to assume that the internalization of its alienated being i.e. of productive social labor, constituted the development of the real. But in, do, but in doing so, it was only too possible to fall into the same trap as Hegel had done by equating the Prussian state with the end of history. It was only too easy to confuse the state as defined by the theoreticians of the proletariat with the class power of proletarians, and to mistake the institutionalization by law of the collective worker for the collective appropriation of the means of production by the producers themselves. No wonder that the ideology of self-proclaimed socialist societies has been dominated by an almost mystical cult of the proletariat, work, and production, forming three externalized and separate entities. The ideology of the relationship between individuals and a society entirely subordinated to the state is more akin to the ideology of the beehive 
i.e. of hyper-organicism in which individual activity is controlled through a transcendent intelligence, or to military ideologies than to communism. That's, I think, right there, my issue, if I have understood correctly, Frederick, with Frederick F. Bender's The Betrayal of Marx. So I like that book. It's really interesting, but I, it's it's tracing a trajectory in early Marx that gets lost in late Marx and then further lost in Kotsky and then further lost in Lenin and then further lost in Stalin and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that is like humanism and and really um, caring about people getting to be people again. Um, but I'm very, I'm vexed on the whole question and issue of humanism because it's poorly defined by most of the people who talk about it like they don't like it. It's poorly defined by a lot of the people who do like it. And it seems to mean different things. In some in some cases, it just means like reading history and historical texts. That's why I'm an anti anti humanist. Um, yeah, because yeah, because there's definitely nothing wrong, definitely nothing wrong with humanism, but it's also like not like a solution. Right, and it, it and it makes more sense to define myself or to define a movement as against the thing that is against the thing that we already are, um, than arguing about. What does it mean to be what we already are? Right. I'm, and I'm more interested in what we can be and that if we have a nature, we are the kind of creature whose nature is a can be. Yeah. It is. We are the, that, which is what I'm getting at when I say virtually purposive. Mm -hmm. But what I'm trying to get at, though, with Frederick F. Bender is that for him, it seems like what he thinks is the humanist streak in Marx is the idea that becoming unalienated would mean finding ourselves um, as part of the whole, like actually represented in the whole, like we'd find ourselves as actually being a part of that thing. So like disalienation or like, you know, the opposite of estrangement then would be some kind of like, oh, now, now, now we're this, this, we're all little bees in a beehive. We just, we don't care about our perverse bourgeois ideological individuality. If that's what's meant when people think about well, when people care about the, the humanist aspect of Marx, that's weird to me because it's the part I care about the least. Like I care about like not having the ability to direct our labor in my terms, time energy, because that's different. It's more theoretically precise, but yeah, I don't know. I just, I, I can't tell, but all I could say is that when I hear some people talking, they really do think of themselves as instruments of a world historical subject and they believe that you're alienated if you don't see yourself as an appendage of that creature and this is exactly what gores is critiquing here that's this military ideology now i one thing that always sticks in my head is one of my old friends who was a, a vet he would say People just need to be on a spaceship. Like if everybody was on a spaceship, it would be obvious we have shared interests and we're a part of a collective and people would get that. But, it, but, and then of course, like you can always do, you, you said it recently, the Buckminster Fuller thing, which is that we're on a planet, you know, spaceship earth. Um, And it's like, yeah, except that like that, that's a hundred million different ways of being human. And all of those have their own kinds of interests and concerns that go beyond like the base, basic material concerns. Anyway, all it makes me, all, all I'm saying is that uh, 
I think a lot of people do want to be a part of something like that where there's life and death stakes and you're part of it. And I do think that any worthwhile human future is going to make room for those human futures, the ones that really do take off on spaceships. But trying to run the Earth like it's a spaceship, a single spaceship, is all the bad things meant by totalization and and imperialism, right? Like, because that would require a language and stuff like that. So, Look, man, I think that's a question of scale. I think we, like, eventually it'll be maybe a question we have to answer. Um, But it's also... Uh, why Dugan's arguments resonate with so many people because because they're like, or fucking why nationalisms and and ethno isms resonate because we do want to belong to something um bigger than ourselves and we we do already belong to something bigger than ourselves we just can't recognize it and we can't articulate it and so we we settle for simulations um and every ideology is a simulation of that and then also what dugan's ultimately calling organic structures of ethno or culturally geopolitically situated specific um belonging that's also yeah and it's also also punk rock punk rock and hardcore and Live, laugh, love, and oh, I, I am the type of person for who this is a convention or whatever. Um, because we're not freed up to actually like be a part of the things that we are a part of. We we have been estranged from that. Um, right. And yeah, doing this militarism this total mobilization or whatever isn't going to solve that because it's it's still a simulation of the thing that we're already a part of that that we're being kept away from by work or by labor or by jobs um or by ideological commitments or whatever all of the things um and so yeah that's a solution or that's a non-solution um and it's, yeah, it's bullshit. And it's the same fucking thing in, in my eyes as fascism. Like, you want to turn me into an appendage. That's all you want to do. Like, that's, no, that's not who I am. That's not what I am. Um, but they think they know what you really are. Right. And they, if, if you don't align yourself with what they think you really are, then you're reactionary, blah, blah, blah. And actually, that's what he's getting at also when he says like, yeah, the proletariat, we don't care what the actual proletariat thinks or does. Like we know what its actual nature is. We know what it needs to be. So it's like, yeah, then you can get called a traitor, a class traitor. Yeah. I'm a class traitor. Over. I'm a, I'm a traitor to myself though. Every goddamn time I, I second myself and my, and my loved ones for work itself. Oh, I, I yeah. sure wish I could parent my kids, but I have to go to work. Fuck off. Well, this is where that, you know, 100 years of sacrifice that Chris Catrone referred to, like, gets me off board. Like, yeah. Well, it was in a, I, don't know, I think that was a private conversation, but I'm sure he stands by it. Just, I, I said something about, I was talking about time energy and like we need freedom from work and all this. And he's like, well, the working class is going to have to sacrifice for another hundred years basically to achieve this freedom from work. And it's like, cool. I guess I'm fine with being a class trader because I'm not going to, I'm not going to do it, man. Right. Um, My, my, my family and my, ancestors worked their entire lives and uh and i don't think it would have been different if they were working for something the 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 concrete result of everyone having to work all the time wouldn't have been different even if we were represented better and didn't have to work quite as much and made more money that it still would be 
if jobs are still the center of our lives, we still can't have our families be the center of our lives. We can't have our communities be the center of our lives. We can't have learning lots of languages be the center of our lives. We definitely can't have philosophy and theory be the center of our lives. So. Oh, this kitty cat wants to play with me now. So my computer, my I got my, check this out. So, you know, I've got my screen here on top of a, a tote and my, so yeah, this is, this is my setup and it should work, but the computer's being weird. And so now I've got to troubleshoot, which I should be able to just go through the motions on if you're able to continue. But I was hoping to be reading at this point from this desktop. So we'll see. I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can get it fixed here in the next 10 minutes. This does not necessarily mean that this type of ideology has no proletarian or Marxist undertones. Marx, and to a greater extent Engels, was fascinated by the quasi-military hierarchy of large factories. The military virtues of discipline, rectitude, self-sacrifice, abnegation, and loyalty to leadership were very, very, rapid, very rapidly came to dominate the internal life of those workers' organizations which claimed allegiance to Marxism. Their leaders presented themselves as functionaries of the proletariat, in the same sense as Hegel had written of functionaries of the universal or Marx of the functionary, functionaries of capital and portrayed the proletariat itself as a mystical entity to which proletarians could only expect to have the same type of relationship as soldiers to an army, that of service and duty. The persistence and universality of an ideology centered upon the notions of service to production, the revolution, the proletarian state, or the people cannot be explained solely in terms of historically specific deviations from the classical Marxist tradition or in terms of gaps in Marxist theory and the legacy of Hegelianism. What needs to be explained is why these gaps in that legacy have had such influence for so long. Closer examination indicates that an explanation is already there in front of our eyes. The proletariat itself, which is part and parcel of the collective worker, mirrors the social organization of the means of production which it sets to work. These means of production are not merely neutral mechanical devices. They embody capitalist relations of domination and exercise their command over working people in the form of inflexible technical requirements. The fact that the entire productive machine requires a quasi-military hierarchical set of relationships and a substantial body of staff officers and quartermasters means that the working class movement is confronted by the following alternatives. Either it holds to a productivist ideology in which the development of the productive forces as is seen as the essential precondition of freedom. There is then no possibility of calling the productive forces developed by capitalism into question. All that matters is to manage and use them more efficiently and even accelerate their rate of development. Consequently, the collective appropriation of the means of production can only amount to this. Workers will be called upon to submit voluntarily to necessities and requirements of social production which previously they had only endured. They will th thus legitimate, through the mediation of their institutional representative, the quasi-military organizational structures required by the process of production. Working class power will consist of power over working people exercised in the name of their class. or the movement accepts that the means of production and a considerable part of what is actually produced do not lend themselves to real and concrete collective appropriation by real proletarians. Then the problem will be that of changing the means and structure of production in such a way as to make them collectively appropriatable. That, however, is neither an easy nor an immediately achievable task. It needs to be undertaken by the collective worker as formed by the development of capitalist forces of production. This requires some sort of internal modification of the working class. 
as well as the redefinition of skills, qualifications, responsibilities, and the division of labor as a whole in the light of essentially political and cultural criteria. It presupposes that, instead of being a sort of negative imprint of the process of production, the working class is able to see it in perspective and redefine it according to its own autonomous goals. The political power of the working class has to be seen as one prerequisite among many in the transformations to be undertaken, rather than as a solution in itself. Chapter 3 The Proletariat as Replica of Capital The process of proletarianization is complete when workers have been stripped of all autonomous capacity to produce their own means of subsistence. For as long as workers own a set of for as long as workers own a set of tools enabling them to produce for their own needs or a plot of land to grow some vegetables and keep a few chickens, the fact that proletarianization will be felt to be accidental and reversible. For ordinary experience will continue to suggest the possibility of independence. Workers will continue to suggest the possibility of independence. Workers will continue to dream of setting themselves up on their own, of buying an old farm with their savings, or of making things for their own needs after they retire. In short, real life lies outside your life as a worker, and being a proletarian is but a temporary misfortune to be endured until something better turns up. However limited it might be, this type of practical autonomy in the dreams and generally unrealizable projects of an independent existence which it allows are a bar to class consciousness. They preclude conscious identification with the proletariat as the inescapable social fate of each of its members. This is why, especially in Britain and Germany, the bourgeoisie, whether consciously or not, has preserved those marginal zones of autonomy formed by tiny allotments or backyards of workers' houses. This is also why proletarian militants have generally opposed the yearning for individual autonomy and dismissed it as a residual sign of petty bourgeois individualism. Autonomy is not a proletarian value. The desire for autonomy has habitually been understood as either a form of regressive nostalgia or a myth which obscures the fact that the existence of a proletariat is essential to capitalism and there can be no way back to the spinning wheel or the windmill. Any proletarian seeking to escape the general condition by individual means is undermining the collective capacity of the proletariat as a whole to overthrow the bourgeoisie and collectively put it into class society. The political imperatives of the class struggle have thus prevented the labor movement from examining the desire for autonomy as a specifically existential demand. The fact that this demand might be politically embarrassing has no bearing at all upon its irreducible reality. Needs may exist for other than political reasons and continue to exist in spite of countervailing political imperatives. This is true of certain existential needs, of an aesthetic, erotic, cultural, or emotional sort, and is most particularly true of the need for autonomy. If one fails to recognize the relative autonomy of existential needs, seeking instead to subordinate them to political imperatives, every trace of them will be continually repressed as tantamount to political deviation or outright betrayal. Repression of this sort is as old as the political and industrial class organizations of a proletariat stripped of its capacities for autonomous work. It existed well before Stalin, and it, has been, and it has continued to exist since his time. It has its roots in the impossibility to experience being a proletarian and, even more, the unity of the proletariat is something individually gratifying and liberating. The being of the class precedes its individual realization since it is nothing but a set of insuperable limits imposed by the social system on the existence of proletarians. One is never free as a member of a certain class, but only within the limits of a class fate which one accomplishes even in the very act of seeking to escape it. The specific class being of the proletarian rests in the fact of being exploited as infinitely interchangeable labor power. Consequently, 
it is not as person that a proletarian is susceptible to exercise any leverage upon his or her exploiters, but only as an infinitely interchangeable being, that is to say, as an other among so many nameless and totally alienated others. Being a proletarian implies that the only weapon you can turn against your exploiters is this very quantity of interchangeable work and working power into which they have made you. The ideal militant is therefore the person most able to internalize this situation. He or she no longer exists as an autonomous individuality, but is instead the impersonal representative of a class which, as we have seen, cannot by definition be the subject of its own identity. The ideal militant must therefore repress his or her subjectivity and become the objective mouthpiece of the class thinking through him or her. Rigidity, dogmatism, wooden language, and authoritarianism are inherent qualities of such impersonal thinking devoid of subjectivity. Like any clergies, this way of thinking is a reflection and extension of a religious and eschatological faith the end of history will be a new beginning, and the first will be the last. Nothing will turn into everything. Since the proletarians have been totally negated by a social system based upon their alienation, their dispossession and self-denial of their individuality will enable them to recover as a class all that has been alienated from them. They must, in other words, lose themselves as individuals to become the masters as a class of the system which alienates them. Reappropriation, a Marxist concept which has lent itself to any number of statist perversions, of this system, which dispossesses and flattens the individuals, is possible only to individuals who give up being anything by themselves so as to become everything as collective agents of the process that produces them. The class as a unit is the imaginary subject who performs the reappropriation of the system but it is a subject external and transcendent to any individual and to all existing proletarians. The power of the proletariat is the symmetrical inverse of the power of capital. There is nothing surprising in this. Marx produced a fine demonstration of how the bourgeois is alienated by his capital. He is the latter's functionary. Well, the proletarian will in the same way be alienated by the proletariat, when it collectively appropriates capital. Thus, the traditional ideology of the labor movement confirms, extends, and even completes the work begun by capital of destroying all autonomous capacities and possibilities among proletarians. The true proletarian performs but purely heteronymous work, which by itself is work completely devoid of usefulness unless it is combined with that of a large number of other workers. Work in this form has been completely socialized. Whatever the techniques and skills involved, they have no use value at all for the individual worker. They cannot be put to any personal, domestic, or private end. Proletarians thus work ex exclusively for society. They are the suppliers of general abstract labor and, consequently, they have to buy all the concrete goods and services they consume. The totally alienated form of their work is matched by the fact that all their material needs express themselves as needs for commodities. That is, needs to buy, needs for money. Everything that proletarians consume has to be bought, and everything they produce is to be sold. No visible link connects consumption with production or the goods bought with the work performed. Because of this absence of visible links, it makes no difference to proletarians what they produce, or what they work for. They have been stripped of all autonomous capacities by capital and compelled to work with the immutable regularity of a giant automaton. Mechanization has given rise to the fragmentation and dequalification of work and made it possible to measure work according to purely quantitative standards. You can do your job and not bother about what happens since the quality of your work and of the finished product depends on the machines, not on you. The entire manufacturing process has been thought out once and for all by specialists whose technical intelligence is embodied in the organization of the workshop. The very meaning of the notion of work is changed. It is no longer the workers who work the machines and adjust their actions and movements to, 
obtain their desired result. Rather, they are being worked on by the machinery. The result of their labor is already there, rigorously programmed, expecting to be produced. The machine is preset, requiring a succession of simple, regular motions. The mechanized system does the work. You merely lend it your body, your brains, and your time in order to get the work done. This is the situation. Work now exists outside the worker, reified to the extent of becoming an inorganic process. Workers are there and fall in with the work that is done. They do not do it themselves. The indeterminate nature of work entails an attitude of indifference. All that matters is the wage packet at the end of the week or month, especially since they don't ask anything else of one. No decisions or initiative. They built the system in which everyone is a cog, turned by the cog on the left and turning the one on the right. So, nothing for free. Do what they tell you, and they can sort out the rest. In this way, any worker, employee, or civil servant can take a malicious pleasure in rigidly adhering to the hierarchical rules and turning their work against the goals it is supposed to serve. One thinks of the French hospital worker refusing to admit an unconscious man delivered in a taxi rather than an ambulance. It is the attitude of all the public employees who avenge themselves on the public for the hierarchic oppression they endure by refusing to do or say or know anything outside their specific duties, or of the famous British example of the woodworkers' union refusing to let metalworkers screw down some hoardings while the metal workers disputed the right of the woodworker to screw boards onto metal, or of all those who stop work as soon as the siren goes, no matter how much waste and damage is caused. This sort of resentment is the only form of freedom left to proletarians in their work. They're expected to be passive? Well then, let's be passive. Or more exactly, let us use passivity as a weapon against those who imposed it. Since their aim is to create passive activity, workers will respond with active passivity. This behavior of resentment which, by overacting the role the worker is expected to play, robs the oppressors of the desired results of their orders, is the last refuge of working class dignity. I'll be like you wanted, and in that way I'll get away from you. Screw the bosses. The gaffer can sort it out. What about our bread? Shit work for shit wages. The language of proletarian resentment is also the language of impotence. It is all a far cry from the abolition of wage slavery and the associated producers who subordinate nature to their collective control. The negation of capital's negation of the worker has not taken place. There is no affirmation. We are left in a one-dimensional universe. In its struggle with capital, the proletariat takes on the identity capital itself has given it. Rather than internalizing their complete dispossession and setting out to construct the universal proletarian society on the ruins of the bourgeois order, proletarians have internalized their dispossession in order to affirm their complete dependence and their need to be taken charge of completely. Since everything has been wrested from them, everything should be given to them. Since they have no power, everything should be provided by those with power. Since their work is of use to society but not to themselves, society should meet all their needs and pay a wage for every kind of work. Instead of demanding the abolition of wage labor, the proletariat has come to demand the abolition of all unwaged work. Yeah. This is, this is good. Are you, how are you feeling? I think I'll finish this chapter and then, then you can go. You need a break, yeah. I think... I'm getting it, but if I don't have it by then, I'll just do it from the laptop. It'll be fine. But uh, I just want to say like this, this bit about resentment and impotence. Um, I think it factors in really well with the wage labor and jouissance piece by Mikey. I think it factors in really well with, uh, oh my God, you got a Dr. Pepper tall boy. Yeah, man. I see you. I see you over there. Hell yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, 
goes well with leotard as well with bidinal economy you know it's like that's like the high French theory way of saying what Gores is saying, but Gores is actually trying to be intelligible and reason with people who genuinely want to train, change society. I don't know what's up with Leotard. Um, but I, cause I, I can't make heads or tails of libidinal economy. I just know that the reason that this was like considered his evil book is because it is the book where he's basically saying the working class loves its oppression. It wants its oppression. I hate that because I, I it ruins people's lives and it breaks them. And those workers who love their oppression are broken people. Mm. They're not like you're they're not people, like they're broken people. Like it's it's like being like it's like saying, Oh, the schizophrenic person loves being schizophrenic. It's like, well, the schizophrenic person is broken. Like they're they they're not able to engage at like this level that you're kind of assuming when you talk about you know these these words that are that are meaningless outside of human subjectivity and so it's like i don't know i i like this i think it's really good especially this part about the oh you can't hammer that or you can't you can't you can't you can't weld this or like yeah like this sort of like malicious compliance malicious compliance yeah and that that that, that goes along with the bureaucracy thing as well you know, the bureaucrat who's like, well, it's just the rules. And he's saying that it's a, it's a way of, it's like the only freedom they can get mm -hmm. in that situation is actually doubling down on their unfreedom. And so it's like, this actually goes really well with the Kantian idea of freedom that McGowan is defending. It's like the dark side of that kind of freedom, right? It's like, I don't make the rules, but I choose them. The rules are already written, but I choose to enforce them and identify with them. And it's like, yeah, there's a freedom that can come from self-limitation. But when that self-limitation is subjugation to and the enforcement of unjust and dehumanizing rules, it's fucking crazy. That's not freedom. And so it's like, I don't know. There's something that has to be done here with this German idealist conception of freedom. It's like, Todd McGowan is focused on the bright side of it, but mm -hmm. I think this brings up the whole dark side of it. Yeah. Working class demands have turned into consumerist mass demands. An atomized, serialized mass of proletarians demand to be given by society, or more precisely the state, what they are unable to take or produce. The working class struggle for power is reduced to mass mobilizations designed to bring representatives of the labor movement into power. The dictatorship of the proletariat as a transitional phase in the construction of communism is reduced to the welfare state taking care of working class needs. The vision of power to the people and socialism is replaced by a political concept in which the state is everything and society nothing where an atomized mass of proletarians, still entirely dispossessed of their own being, is patronized by the parties that run the government and turn into the mouthpiece of government itself. Parties of this sort no longer translate popular into political demands and actions, but rather they convey to the masses the necessities of government and the technocratic imperatives of the centralized state. It is difficult to see how things could be otherwise in a society in which the development of the productive forces has ensured that every activity is socialized and thereby fragmented, rationalized, technicized, and articulated with other activities through the mediation of the state apparatus. No consumption, production, communication, transportation, illness, healthcare, death, learning, or exchange occurs without the intervention of centralized administrations or professional agencies. The concentration of capital has destroyed the social fabric at its roots by destroying every possibility of autonomous production, consumption, and exchange, rather, whether for individuals, groups, or communities. No one produces what they consume or consumes what they produce. No productive unit, even if controlled by the associated producers, produces or is able to produce according to the needs or desires of the local population. No city, even if its inhabitants were to organize into a commune, 
is capable of manufacturing the things necessary to cover its vital needs or of obtaining its food through exchange with the surrounding rural communities. The division of labor now exists at transnational levels. Product lines and the location and size of factories are determined by calculations of overall profitability. Certain components are produced in certain amounts in one place to be, com to be combined 100 miles away with other components produced in another factory and give birth to a finished product distributed over a whole continent. The same type of quasi-military staff found on factory level coordinates coordinates the activities of different factories, managing the flow of their semi-finished products, the sale of the finished products, the, finance, the financing of exports and stocks, the adjustment of demand to supply, and so on. Nowhere in all of this does any worker or workers' collective experience reciprocal exchange or cooperation toward a result viewed as useful by all concerned. Instead, every worker encounters his or her dependence upon the state at every label, level, for supplies of vital goods, for the purchasing power of the wage, for security of employment, the length of the working week, housing, transport, etc. Thus, the spontaneous reflex of the working class is to demand that this dependence upon the state be matched by duties of the state vis-a-vis -vis the working people. Since the working class can do nothing for itself, it follows that the state should do everything for the working class. Since it has an absolute need of the state, the state ought to recognize the class as an absolute right. The seizure of state power by the working class is replaced by state protection for the working class. Anything lying between the class and the state tends to be abolished. It will be an easy process since, since the political mediations, the institutions particular to civil society in the Gramscian sense, the fabric of social relationships and autonomous channels of communication have already been emptied of all content by monopoly capitalism. The monopoly capitalist state can no longer be considered, as the traditional bourgeois state once was, to be an emanation of the power exercised by the bourgeoisie within civil society, at the level of the relations or production and exchange of ideology and cultural models, the values of family and interpersonal relations. It is no longer possible to think of this sort of power running from society to the local political institutions under le the legitimating guise of electoral representation. Instead, the monopoly capitalist state, like monopoly capital itself, is an autonomized apparatus of domination and administration whose unrestricted power runs down toward a dislocated society which it endeavors to restructure according to the requirements of capital. Through this sheer size and concentration of its economic units, capital is no longer subject to the influence and control of its juridical owners and, having broken the framework of bourgeois law, now requires centralized state regulation and possibly although not necessarily, state ownership as conditions of its scientific management. There is no room or flexibility in this dislocated society for the mutual adjustment between decentralized local initiatives running upwards and centralized state proposals running downwards. As a result, local political life no longer exists, and because of its absence, there are no political movements capable of carrying out a democratization of either state or society. Political life has been reduced to orchestrated debates centered upon how to exercise centralized authority and manage the government. Debates of this type necessarily set those who control the state against those aspiring to do so, while the rest of the population are consigned by both sides to the role of supporters. They are thus invited to choose between the domination of state monopoly capitalism and the all-pervading domination of the monopoly of state capitalism. Lenin was right in indicating that the line separating state monopoly capitalism from state capitalism was a narrow one. The latter is nothing more than the completion, on the ruins of civil society, of the process of subordination of society to the state carried out by the former. Once completed, the process serves only to rationalize and perpetuate in a higher form those capitalist relations of production which the seizure 
seizure of power by the working class was supposed to bring to an end. If things are to, to develop otherwise, then there must be a radical rupture. And if there is to be a rupture, then the working class must act as a force refusing, along with its class being, to accept the matrix of capitalist relations of production of which this being bears the imprint. But how will it acquire the capacity to undertake this negation its, of itself? This is a question which Marxism as a positive science cannot possibly answer. If the working class is what it is, if its class being is positive, then it can only cease to be what capital has made it through a rupture in the structure of capital itself. This rupture will give rise to a new structure and thereby engender a transformed working class. This has been the type of structural determinist conception put forward by Maurice Godelet, among others. It contains no room for any idea of the proletariat negating itself or any notion of the liberation and sovereignty of the associated producers. Instead, it merely posits a change of one positive being into another, without any possibility for this change, the transition from capitalism to communism, to be the result of an action carried out consciously by individuals pursuing their own ends. Marx's vision was initially a quite different one. The proletariat was to be capable of negating itself because its class being was really a negativity disguised as positivity. The proletariat was defined as the universal and sovereign producer negated by capital, dispossessed of its own product and reality. Only because the class being of the proletariat was negation was it possible for the act by which it negated this being to be an act of sovereign affirmation, its own emancipation. This initial vision, which still occupied a central position in the German ideology, was never properly defined or developed by Marx himself. To do so, it would have been necessary to develop a critical phenomenology of proletarian alienation, showing how workers are negated in their individual and social lives in a way which conceals from them the negativity of their class being and the possible positivity of negating that being, showing, in other words, that workers could only be themselves by negating what they are as proletarians. Although the possibility of such an act of negation exists ontologically in Marx, also in Sartre, it does not necessarily exist in cultural terms. Workers' capacity to recognize the difference between their objective position as cogs in the productive machine and their latent potential as an association of sovereign producers is not inherent in the proletarian condition. The question is under what circumstances this capacity is likely to emerge and develop. Up to now, Marx's theory has been unable to produce an answer to this problem. Worse, its predictions have been belied by the facts. Bum, bum, bum. Yeah, so... It's not looking good for me. This computer needs something. I'm thinking it probably just needs to be cleaned out. Um, maybe get a full like uh, system reset. But basically right now it's being a piece of shit. And I'm just surrounded by garbage ass devices. But I definitely want to take a turn reading, so I'm just going to set up like this and do it right here. <sighs> this computer was working fine when I put it into storage. That's the weird thing. It's like it shouldn't have been a problem. It just needs some uh, some TLC. I think so. Just need some TLC. Tender loving. Let's see, though. I think, let's see. 
Yeah, I can definitely take it from here if you want to give up the uh the co the screen share. What what chapter are we on? Four. All right. What do we want to say to people who are listening? I want to give you a moment to talk. You've been talking, you've been reading for a while, but I want to give you a moment to talk because I'm interested. You've been a Marxist, you've loved uh Michael Parenti. Um and as a lover of Michael Parenti, I'm wondering, how does this hit? Yeah, I mean, it definitely. <sighs> there were people who would say, oh, th like you've just turned Marxism into a religion. Um, and that was always like kind of like oh that's just lazy like you're just being lazy that's a lazy critique um but the way gores is like breaking it all down and he is kind of demonstrating love for marx for marx and marxism like he's not just shitting on it and just doing the thing like he really is kind of um taking bits of marx to dismantle what marxism became um it's awesome and it like it it's laying bare the fucking problems with marxism um and i love it and he's not just doing that he's doing a lot of other shit that also resonates on on other levels uh but just the ability to like to use like proper marxism to kind of show how marxists are being silly and leninists are being silly and trots are being silly and like all this shit it's awesome and i think you can't be a Marxist and and come away from reading Gore's um and and not I don't know change or something I don't know I don't want to say change like I just can't imagine a smart Marxist reading this and coming away uh feeling exactly as they felt before which i think is awesome like I, I i think we need to do that there are so many people who they just want to put on the the outfit and belong to an organization and do the thing and play the role uh and that's fine because again we all do that and we all need to do that um but that's not what like Marx was that's not what Marx was doing. So like if you want to follow in his footsteps or if you want to like take his project project seriously, you really do need to engage with it. Um in the way that Gores is doing. I'm not saying you had you need to agree with Gores, but like Gores is actually doing uh the right thing by interrogating these uh positions and and assumptions and presuppositions and all that shit and i love it it's great and i don't think um it takes anything away at all from how i view the project now i don't know maybe f 10 years ago i might have felt differently but like no i think this is this is a necessary addition to all the work that's come before and I think he 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 is post Marx in the in the best sense of the meaning, meaning that he you know he follows him, uh, not contradicts or counteracts or contravenes or any of these things. Like just because he's post Marx doesn't mean he's against Marx, um, and and that's a a good thing.
I also like how he's explaining how um, we're already robots. I like that a lot. Um, and the instrumentalization. I think that's a necessary thing that people... Thing that people think. Whoa. Techno. Techno okay. party. Why, why, why is this happening? Is that on my side? Or you, that's No, that's not on my side. Hold on one sec. Hold on one sec. Aw. Okay. Sick. I fixed it. You can hear me? Yep. Sick, dude. All right. Well, that means we're in business. Uh, now I just have to get the PDF. Uh, and then I'll be able to read. But I think it's not on this computer yet. So let me... Pretty sure it's in go. Google. It's in Google Drive. Is it? Okay. Yeah. Like our... It's in one of the shared... We don't even have an effective way of sharing links right now because I still have to fix the chat issue. Yeah. Let's see. Andre Gores. See, I just feel like we got ripped off somewhere along the way. Who are the people hiding the likes of Pistone and Gores and Matic and Einrich? It's the um it's the fucking the DSA, dude. It's the DSA. It's the suppo- it's the supposed materialists. Um. Yeah, it's weird though. All right, now let's see. Can I give make host? Let me see if I can make make me host. Make the other you host. Leave leave, leave from the laptop. All right, good. Now I'm here. Oh. I just realized the problem with that. I was recording. On that one? Yeah. Were you recording local or to the cloud? Mm. Oh, it's lo- oh, it OBS local. Uh, well, it's a good thing I have That's... the whole thing on OBS. Yeah, but also this is a point that we could skip. We can. We don't need this part. Right. Um, you're right, though. It is, it is in drive. But yeah, you do have the whole thing, so we can just go with that. The let's see. Yeah, I want you to. You could go skateboarding. You don't have to. Like, I'll be reading for a bit now, so you don't have to be here for that. If you want to do something, you have read more than your fair share. All right. Yeah, so thanks for bearing with me. Um, just about to have this downloaded. Uh, and then up. I think OBS is probably good to go. Mm. I don't like this this angle, but it will have to it'll have to do the trick for now. And I do have, I've done two internet speed tests on this new computer from this, and it's saying, at least, that I've got 50, 50 upload. Nice. 50 megabits per second upload. Nice. So you can stream with that. It is, that is doable. It's definitely better than I've had before. Okay, downloading. Let's see if I can get us on here. Just find a display capture. There is something really peculiar about how slow this computer is loading, and it's freaking me out. Probably gonna Are need to update. Yeah, probably. Not in OBS, dude. Not anymore. 
Yeah, what the hell, OBS? We I liked that ability. I liked it a lot. Yeah. It might be, I don't know, a new, I don't know, a new thing you have to change in the settings on, on the most recent update or something. I don't fucking know. Well, if you can see, I've got my save as for the Andre Gore's recording is not responding and is stalled out. Oh, there we go. It only took a minute. And then I've got uh, trying to create the new display capture for this Zoom save. All right, all right, all right. Yeah, you need to go skateboarding. If you're yawning, it's skateboard time. Yeah. All right, chapter six. Four. Okay. Um, should be able to, oh, here we go. I'll screen share so you can see it. Or window share to be, to be accurate. Cool. All I have to do is set the... Ooh. Now I'm wondering, is this going to record both of us? It should record both of us, but I have to do a test to make sure. Loading again. I've put my computer into storage a lot of times. I haven't had to deal with this. I think you should stop the recording on your OBS side and then get that uploading because 